Uh, it is now 7.34 p.m. on Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I would first like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Ben Holly. Here. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli is unable to join us this evening. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Great. Good to have you all. Uh, joining us uh, also, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. And we have Mike Champa, who is the Director of Inspectional Services. Here. Good to have you with us. And then for the cases we have this evening, um, appearing on behalf of 49 Dixon Avenue, we have Verma Sutir. Here. Yeah. Good to have you with us. For docket 37799 Morton Road, Kate and Anthony Gregorio. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, for docket 378253 Lansdowne Road, we have Rebecca and Timothy Center. Here. See you both. And uh, docket 3783 186 Overlook Road, uh, Luhana and Peter Kane. There you are. Great. So good evening, everyone. This meeting, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We're going to start this meeting with um, agenda item number two, um, which actually has been, uh, item number two is a duplicate of item five, so we will cover that again. So we have item number three, uh, which is the approval of the decision for docket 377795 um, George Street. This was a case that was heard at our previous meeting. Uh, the board voted in approval. We have a written decision that was uh, written by Mr. Hanlon and distributed to the board for comment. And final issue of the decision was sent out this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regard to the written decision for 95 George Street? Seeing none, I will take a motion to accept the written decision for 95 George Street. Oh, Mr. Hanlon, you are muted. Sorry about that. Uh, so moved. Thank Second. you. 
Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to approve the written decision for 95 George Street. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to item four on our agenda, which is the approval of the decision for docket 37896 Jason Street. Uh, this was heard at our January 9th hearing. Uh, the motion of the board was to approve uh, the application. The decision was written by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments. And final issue of the decision was this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 96 Jason Street? Seeing none, the chair will take a motion to accept the written decision for 96 Jason Street. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So vote of the board to approve the written decision, uh, 96 yeah, Jason Street. Um, uh, Mr. Hi, DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. So this brings us to the hearing section of our agenda this evening. So before opening for public hearings, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Any vote taken at this hearing will be preliminary until the written decision is approved by the board at a subsequent meeting. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. So with that, uh, the next item on our agenda um, is docket 3776, uh, 49 Dixon Avenue. This is a continuance of a prior, um, uh, from a prior meeting uh, January 9th. And so if I could ask the applicant uh, to reintroduce himself and tell us what changes have been uh, put forward since we last saw him. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clean, for the opportunity. This is Sudhir Verma, 49 Dixon Avenue. This is a continuation of our request from the last time. Last time, we submitted a special request for a large addition and a covered post, too. Uh, and there were some comments regarding the uh, grading of the house. So we have updated the plans. And also, there was a comment regarding the uh, production of the tree, which was at the uh, expansion of the driveway for that also we have added that to the plot plan so both have been submitted so i think that's the overview great thank you i'll go ahead and share um the updated plot plan uh as you see before us here so this is the plot plan the uh the numbers now that are in red are the proposed elevations so the applicant mm -hmm. is the the issue as it was before was that the um, there was a sufficient portion of the uh, basement level that was exposed that it would qualify as a story. And in that case, the house would have been three and one half stories instead of two and a half stories, which is not allowed under our bylaw. And so the applicant has gone back um, and is reworking the grade of the site to make sure that the uh, that lowest basement level no longer qualifies as a story. And so for that, uh, there's the, the uh, raising of the height of the site. At, um, it's noted here for the four corners, but essentially that would be the, the new grade. Um, that grade would need to be uh, verified um, at the conclusion of the project to make sure um, that the that basement level does not uh, qualify as a story should the, the board vote to approve the application. Um, and then I'm just gonna switch. Um, Oops, to a different sheet. So this, these are the proposed elevations. Um, and so you can see the bubble number here that is changed. Um, so this is the revised elevation, which now has the height from the average grade to the underside of the ceiling at four foot three and a half, which is less than four foot six. And so it no longer qualifies as a story um, so because of that a variance is not required which brings it back to um 
it's it's essentially now just a request for a special permit um and that specifically it would be for a large addition um we had discussed the uh, the initially proposed um the proposed deck and the proposed porch um so there's a porch here at the front which will be um 20 yeah, think, eight yeah. feet from the front lot line um and then there's an open deck here which will be 16.6 .6 feet uh from the second front lot line the front lot along wheeler avenue oh excuse me wheeler lane wheeler. and then on this side these steps are uh, with it, are beyond the the setback, so these these are okay, and this is an existing deck that's being removed. And then, as the applicant had also noted, this is the the tree that has been we were asking about. So he is noting that the four inch tree is to be protected. Yes, I think the a driveway is not extended all the way to the tree, so there is still space there. Okay, so this this yeah, proposed driveway expansion will not happen. So uh, uh, this will happen, but it will it will protect the tree because we have uh, also a number the driveway width, which is a sixteen point seven something right now, so which was not there before. Okay. Yeah, which is right now ten, and I think it's sixteen point seven. No, we have added okay. the number there. Yeah. Great. So with that, um. I know at the previous hearing we had four members mm -hmm. of the board who were able to hear the the, the initial hearing. Um, Venkat Holly has gone back and reviewed the recording and filed uh, paperwork stating that he has reviewed the case to date, um, which uh, under the the Mullen rule allows him to vote um, on the final application. So we do have five members who are eligible to vote on this this evening. Um, So with that, are there further questions from the board in regards to this application? Mr. Chair. Mr. Holly. Um, so the grade at the corner is 114.2 relative to what was the previous grade? Um, oh, if I make it. So this corner shows 14, it was 13, 113.58. And then at the bottom corner, left corner. Uh, it's 113.14 going up to 114.2. So it's going up just over a foot. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and then I'm assuming, so the grade, this, the grades would need to carry away from the building um, for us for a certain distance and then they can taper back into the existing site level. I think so. Yeah. And then this corner. Yeah, 113.38 is about the closest to going to 114.2. And then this corner here is already 115.5, and that's remaining at 115.05. So this is the proposed elevation to Dixon. This would be the elevation of facing uh, Wheeler on the side. This would be facing the adjacent building and this would be facing the backyard. Um, that note before, it's a, the, it's a rather high straight elevation. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was concerning to other members of the board. I know on the side facing um the two public faces on wheeler there is a carved in deck uh deck up here and there is this exposed deck down below and then facing onto dixon there's the covered porch um and then the 
the awning here. So there are some smaller scale features facing the street, but the side opposite and the, the rear are relatively long and flat. No cons no questions from the board. We'll go ahead and um so I will now go ahead and open this hearing for public comment. Public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand, should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone can dial star nine to indicate they would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address for the record, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Um, and anyone wishing to address the board a second time, um, should the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to be called upon first. So with that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? I uh, see Mr. Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I want to uh, thank the applicant for having uh, done that driveway shift and to uh, help protect that tree. Um, I would further ask, though, through you, uh, has the applicant uh, spoken with the tree warden about uh, a tree plan? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we have not talked yet, but I don't know whether that was a request last time. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, remind the applicant that on with, for a large renovation, um, a tree plan is required. And although the plot plan does show the trees, it doesn't speak to the protection methods that the trees are going to require during construction. Um, and uh, also, what uh, if there are any additional protected trees that are required? I mean, it doesn't look like there are, and, and that's good. Um, and I, I know that the applicant expressed a um, a real concern for the trees himself before. And so that that's that's good to know. But really, there, there does need to be a meeting between the tree warden and themselves because the, the tree plan has to be provided uh, through a, a certified arborist. Um, mm -hmm. And that just I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, the applicant was aware of that before they'll issue the uh, building permit. Um, and, and also, I wanted to uh, thank the board. I'm not sure if this happened by mistake or on purpose, but in looking at the materials that get added to the agenda um, for for particularly for continuous cases, there is a date on the, the renovation plan, which is helpful to know what material is new and what came from the first meeting that's not new. However, I didn't notice a, a date was missing on the plot plan update. And I thought, well, maybe we just lucked out that there was a date on the first one because the dates really help people like me address what's new material or the continuance. So uh, thank you for that, if that was the intent. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this item? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment for the hearing on 49 Dixon Avenue. Uh, so this brings it back to the board. Um, so what we have in front of us is um, an uh, application under 542B6, which is the uh, large addition. Um, and um, we also have um, I believe just want to go and refer to the zoning bylaw. <laughs> So under uh, so under five three nine, um, so porches greater than twenty five square feet can extend um, into the existing into the front yard setback by a special permit, and unenclosed decks which do not project more than ten feet into the front yard or more than five feet into the side yard. So in this case, um, 
the proposed uh, deck being 16.8 feet does not extend. So the, de the proposed deck uh, does not require a special permit. Um, this property is in the R1 district. And so the front yard setback is 25 feet. So it does project into the front yard setback, the proposed porch. So that would also, under 539A, it would require a special permit um, in addition to the large addition. So are there any, is there any further discussion among the board? Seeing none, um, so the board, if for a large addition, um, the board needs to make several findings in order to approve. Uh, the first is that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Um, this is a rather large addition um, for a large addition, uh, but the size of the proposed building is not unduly um, out of scale with the district. Um, the and the use is allowed um, by permit, uh, by right, and uh, the size can be allowed and the porch can be allowed uh, under the bylaws under sections 542B6 and 539A. Uh, requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience or welfare. Um, so the, the, the use of uh, of residential property in town for residential purposes, the expansion of that to uh, fit the needs of uh, residents in town are uh, are typically considered a public a public good. Um, this the expansion of the tax base is good for the town, and uh, the porch and the deck allow the property to uh, have a connection with uh, with neighbors who would be passing on the street, and allows the the house to. Uh, to have more contact with the public. Um, the number three, the use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, it does not affect um, the sidewalk with because there is no sidewalk um, and just will not increase the number of the amount of traffic. It will have a wider driveway, um, which will uh, so that the, but I don't think that adds significantly to any potential uh, pedestrian safety in front of the property. Um, number four, the use will not overload any public system. It will not change uh, the public systems that are required for the building. Uh, the, the prop, that there are special regulations involved, and these are the two that have been mentioned, which is the 539A regarding porches and 542B6 uh, regarding large additions. Um, Requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, it will it is it will still remain a single family home um, in this neighborhood. Um, it should not impact uh, the character or the integrity. Uh, will be not be detrimental to public health or welfare, and will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. So those those findings are um, the special permit findings, which we use to determine whether. Um, whether it is in harmony. And the second for large additions is consider the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Um, so this is a single family home in a single family neighborhood. So there, um, there should not be any issue in regards to the uses. Um, in regards to abutting structures, um, the abutting driveway is pretty much right on the property line. Um, adjacent to this house. So there, there is approximately 20 plus feet between the, the building, uh, this house and the adjacent house. Uh, so um, the board would need to find that that, that that dimension is appropriate and uh, consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. Uh, so that the in bylaw that you know, the, the intention is to preserve the character of the neighborhood to um, preserve access to light and air um, and other things as put forward in section one of the zoning bylaw. Uh, so those are the findings that the board would need to make uh, by way of its vote. Um, are there any further questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Hamlin. <clears throat> I just wanted to go one step further. When you look at on when you look at at the map and when you go there, um, the property that's immediately, I guess, it's to the right of this uh, <clears throat> property, the one on at forty five Dixon, um, <clears throat> seems to is seems reasonably far away. And when I'm focused now on where the structures are, um, and uh the, the the this will be somewhat larger than that house which was i think recently renovated but the uh uh it certainly when you're there it, it looks as if that's a reasonable distance the the closer house actually is the one in the rear that's at three wheeler street um and that too that is, that has a driveway that's immediately adjacent to the rear lot line um and when you're there the driveway is as you can see right on the rear lot line um <clears throat> not the driveway but there's a, a small area there um but that's a that's ultimately a pretty fair distance as well and if you imagine that house expanding in the way that it will um uh, it seemed to me at least in looking at it that uh the structures were sufficiently separated that I mean, what you're looking for here is a risk that an overly large building here would inappropriately lord it over a neighboring building. And I think that's not going to, to happen here. But uh, so I just wanted to sort of go a, a step further to look at the map and see where the, all of these things, um, where all these things are. But my conclusion still is that, uh, as is often the case, the this this is well it's quite a, it's quite a large building even for this neighborhood it, it's not particularly large compared to the house in the rear um but it's a little closer and uh or will be a little closer but not so much i think to create um a the problem that the zoning bylaw is aimed to prevent thank you mr hanlon <laughs> Anything further from the board? Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. LeBlanc. Um, just as a, another point, um, they the applicant would need to, uh, we would need a vote to withdraw their application for the variance if they wish, since they no longer need it. And it's, it's on our docket, right? That's how we've done it in the past. That is a very good point. Yes. We will make sure to get that. Um, should the, so the, should the board vote to approve the special permit, um, there are three standard conditions that the board would include in a decision such as this. The first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Number two is the building inspector is hereby notified they are to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. Building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints if necessary. The building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, so with that, are there any additional, um, uh, conditions I would propose the board has in the past had a condition that the board requests the applicant work with the tree warden to address compliance with the town's tree protection and preservation bylaw. And I think that would be appropriate here as that has been raised as a question. Um, are there any other items which the board would wish to raise. Seeing none, uh, the chair will then accept a motion. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. I, move, I move that the board approve the application subject to the three standard conditions and the additional condition relating to uh, consulting with the tree warden that the chairman has just read into the record. Second. And just to clarify, um, that would be a motion to approve the special permit application. Yes, I, I let me just sort of step back for a second. The there, 
it's all kind of confused. There are two different special permits and the motion includes both of them. Um, okay, so we will, uh, so we'll go ahead and vote on the special permit and then we, the board will go back and vote on the variance. Um, so with that, what the motion the board has in front of it is a motion to approve a special permit application for 49 Dixon Avenue with the uh, three standard conditions and the one additional conditions. And this covers the those two sections that we had referenced earlier, uh, 539A and 542B6. Um, so then a roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the special permit is approved. And then uh, the, the chair will take a motion to withdraw the variance request for 49 Dixon Avenue. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Just in terms of the procedure here, I, I think that the, with the way that this that the withdrawal has been handled in the past as the applicant has requested that we has requested to withdraw and that we've approved his request to withdraw the application. I think it, that's that sort of lines up with the way the law is written. That I, very well taken. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Verma, would you be willing to um, as a as the variance is no longer required, would you be willing to withdraw your request for a variance? Yes. Okay, so then this would be a motion to accept the withdrawal for the variance for 49 Dixon Avenue. Good. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So vote of the board to accept the withdrawal of a variance request for 49 Dixon Avenue. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The variance request is with its withdrawal is accepted. And that is everything for 49 Dixon Avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you all for taking the time in reviewing the application and the approval. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Um, so with that, because the board has the building inspector with it, um, I'm going to um, move, ask that we, the board to take up item uh, Docket the item number eight on the agenda, which is docket 3783186 Overlook Road, which is an appeal of the decision of the building inspector. Um, I'm bringing this forward to uh, so that this is the only item that um, he needs to be present for on tonight's hearing. So I just wanted to make sure to move this up so he could uh, present his side of the case. Uh, so with that, I would ask um, the appellant um, to uh, address the board and uh, explain what the situation is and what the what decision of the zoning inspector they are appealing. Oh, I'm sorry, you're you're still on mute, ma'am. That's mute. Can you hear there me? You yep, yep, you're all set. Okay. So um I'm just replacing my sh old shed, which falling apart after like almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in the meantime, because I'm renovating my basement, so I make it a little larger so it can put uh, put my all the junks from my basement to the uh, shed. So that's, um, and it's under 200 square feet under the Massachusetts state law. It don't need permit. Also, mm -hmm. I search on the online, Building code of Arlington, and it doesn't mention anything about the shed. Now uh, we uh, we had been living in Arlington for almost twenty years, and never really uh, get informed about uh, any law by law mm -hmm. about the shed. I mean, so so I just uh, replace it, the, and uh, um, there's a uh, 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 replace it exactly same spot as my old shed is. And mm -hmm. around the shed is uh, all six feet of the tall fence from my neighbors. All my neighbors have like 60, uh, six feet tall solid wood sh uh, fence around mm -hmm. it. So 
they really cannot see the shed, but all they can see is the roof. So obviously one of my neighbor uh, in the blue house uh, complained uh, to the inspectors that uh, said he saw the roof. Mm. <laughs> but uh, the first thing, uh, there's a roof there for almost 20 years. The second thing that the inspector told me to uh, move my shed six feet away mm -hmm. from the uh, rear line. Uh, but that neighbor actually on the side, there's no house behind um, my backyard. So that, that neighbor in the blue house actually on the side, but in the back. So if I move forward my shed, that neighbor will see much more sh uh, roof. <laughs> so, so, so if I, if, so the inspector's order doesn't solve the complaint, but it's worse than it. So that's, um, so, uh, just uh, just make make that neighbor complain to see more roof. Uh, plus, uh, so it's it's winter now. So the and the, uh, it's it's not easy to move that shed because it needs a foundation. So for this uh, uh, shed, the foundation itself almost cost me ten k. And then not to mention the building up, like they charge me um over 5,000 just to build it up. I ordered the kit from the, uh, it's a, like a shed kit mm -hmm. from the Home Depot. So just okay. put it up together. And um, I also actually, uh, I consider about my neighbor's fence, I actually cost, uh, spend almost uh, uh, over 1,000 to build a gutter. So make the uh, shed, make the water actually collect the water and mm -hmm. redirect the water to the, to the, uh, away from my neighbor's shed, uh, neighbor's fence and actually all the way to the furthest point into my yard. It's cost my over a thousand for doing that because I uh, I don't want my, I mean, water from my roof actually damage my neighbor's uh, fence. It's cost me over a thousand, which I can, actually can buy a brand new uh, plastic shed. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, it's, it's really, it's it's just a shed. I mean, it's replaced my old shed and there's a big fence around it. Uh, it doesn't affect my neighbor at all. Uh, and there's a no house issue, no safety issue. And uh, uh, it's just a shed, seriously, it's just a shed. It's so simple. And um, so, because it's a, so it just costs so much money to, build that shed, it's not as easy to move that shed, especially now the winter time, the ground are frozen. And uh, just uh, just very practical, very difficult. And also it's really unnecessary uh, hardship because if I move my shed forward six feet, I mean that neighbor in a blue house will see more roof. It really doesn't solve anything, but uh, just uh, worsen it. So uh, I just uh, request uh, the relief from this order because it's uh, just uh, give me unnecessary hardship and practical mm -hmm. difficulty and uh, uh, lots of financial, uh, also um, lots of the, I mean, financial mm -hmm. uh, money too. So uh, uh, plus doesn't really solve any complaint. It doesn't really, the only complaint is because my neighbor say the roof. I mean, it's nothing else, but just order, if I obey the order and it doesn't solve the complaint, I'm worsening. So it, it just doesn't make sense. So I just request for the relief mm -hmm. for this uh, order. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just show the, um, so just the, this is just the map of the area. Um, so this is the property at 186 Overlook. Um, and so the current, sh the, the shed's not actually straddling. This is, it's actually within the property. Um, it's where the existing shed, the right. prior shed, excuse me, the prior shed was. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, there's houses, um, there's abutting houses, properties on the other sides. And then um, this I is an image from, this is a, from Google, um, so it just shows you. So this is that the initial shed that was there prior, right, 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 in the back yeah, corner of the right. lot. Yeah, it's a, it's falling apart after twenty years. Yes, okay. so I put a new shed exactly at the same spot. Yes, and then um, 
oh, it is sharing the right thing already. Um, so this is um, the new shed okay. uh, that was put up. Um, so as you can see, it's right on the property line. Um, it is uh, larger than 80 square feet, uh, but less than 200 square feet in area. Right, right, right. Um, but it's, and it's taller than seven feet. Um, well, it's just a kit. It comes with this yeah. height. <laughs> right. Uh, so that's just an image of it from, so you can see how, how much of it's exposed over the fence. Um, is there a third image? Oh, sorry, there's a third image. Yeah, so that's another picture of the, the shed from the yard. Hmm. And then... Um, Let's go to the, so this is the, I just wanted to go to the zoning bylaw on this. Um, so in the definition section, um, a shed is defined as an accessory structure, not greater than 80 square feet, used for the storage of tools or equipment. Uh, so this is larger than 80 square feet. So it doesn't, so by the definition, it doesn't really qualify as a shed. It's more just sort of a larger accessory structure. Um, and then uh, an accessory building or structure is building, the use of which is customarily incidental to the principal building located on the same lot and as that occupied by the principal building. So it is an access, it is considered an accessory building. Um, in the bylaw. So accessory buildings and other structures in residence districts, a minor accessory building shall be exempt from the side and rear yard requirements. If said building dimensions result in a gross floor area of not more than 80 square feet and a building height of not more than seven feet. So um, as it's stated, this is larger than 80 square feet and taller than seven feet. Uh, so it would not be a minor accessory building. Um, and so we go to uh, the requirements for the district. Um, so accessory buildings or structures need to be at least 10 feet from the front yard, which this obviously is, uh, but the side and rear yard setbacks are six feet in both cases. And um, as an accessory dwell structure greater than 80 square feet. Um, it's it's allowed to be up to 20 square feet in height, but because it, of its proximity, it's the issue is not the height in this case. Um, it's the location um, being closer than six feet to the property line. Um, is there anything else? What is, what would I have in 65? Um, and so the other question is, would it be a garage? Um, but private detached garages don't need to be conformed to the setbacks, but they have very specific requirements for fireproof construction, which is that type one, type two construction, which allows them to be constructed closer to the lot line. And then as was stated before, the the state building code has no requirement for a building permit um, if it's under 200 square feet. So the, I, I think you know, we're also gonna, we can sort of see that this building is not built to the to what the zoning code requirement is. Um, and so, um, would ask that if, let me go ahead and stop share and then um, questions or comments from the from members of the board in regards to um, sort of the nature of this shed and the the uh, the statements brought forward by the applicant in regards to potential hardship of uh, of relocating the shed from its condition from its current position. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, a couple of things. One is that <clears throat> narrowly the first question before us is whether 
the building inspector's uh, determination is in accordance with the bylaw. Um, this isn't a discretionary thing where he can apply the uh, uh, apply the uh, uh, district regulation on page five fifteen. I think it is of the zoning bylaw. If it seems like a good idea, or you can easily excuse it, there's there's a requirement that it be at least six feet away from the relevant property lines, and that requirement is uh, is not met. And there's really nothing that Mr. Champa could do about that. Even all of the things that Ms. K Ms. Kame mentioned are things that have to do with an unfortunate series of circumstances, but. They're not things that would justify uh, or that would enable us legally to override the determination of the uh, of the building inspector. There's no real discretion there. Um, it is possible, and it's sometimes done. And we could we I think have got the legal authority to sort of change this into a variance application and say, well, it doesn't meet the zoning bylaw, but there's some sort of an unreasonable hardship there. In some places, practically every variance comes up through an appeal to the building inspector. So that isn't necessarily a, a crazy thing. But in that situation, you'd have to meet the criteria that are for a variance under state law. And while I think that there certainly is a great deal of hardship there, it doesn't come from the uh, topography, soil conditions, or shape of the lot. Uh, and so it would not really avail uh, the uh, the the uh, appellant uh, for us to go in that direction. The state law doesn't allow for that kind of relief. Um, I feel sort of sorry that we're in this situation. Um, I would like when Mr. Champa addresses this, as I assume he would soon, is to understand better that if the state building code doesn't require a building permit, the way in which a zoning requirement of this kind is actually enforced, if one is assuming that there should be some sort of a permit or some sort of a review that enables people to uh, that enables people to uh, present this in advance to inspectional services and and determine uh, whether. Uh, you know whether or not this is a lawful change and i'd like to know a little more about how that's done although i'm not sure that it would make any difference in either of the questions before us which one is is mr champa right on the law and the other is if he's not right on the law would this be a circumstance in which a variance would be appropriate and i think both of those are determinable largely without have, have nothing to do really with prejudice and have a great deal to do with just what the law says with that, I would uh, ask Mr. Shampa if he could go ahead and address the questions raised by Mr. Hanlon. Sure. Um, so it's challenging when there's not a building permit required for uh, work to be done. Um, we do have handouts and guidelines, uh, the guidelines on uh, the requirements for different size accessory structures, et cetera. Um, but often is the case that um, we're not consulted because a building permit is not required. Um, the, the guidelines that we have, uh, the handouts that we have specifically state that anything over uh, over 80 square feet or taller than seven feet, um, we require a plot plan to show the location of the structure. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity to have those conversations with the, with the applicant. Um, and weren't called until the shed was almost, well, the accessory structure was almost completed. Um, so it was just, it was an unfortunate situation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. <clears throat> one thing just to be really clear about this is that the, the, the with the, the complaining neighbor, whoever that was, um, has every right to complain, of course. And, uh, but the issue here is not his his or her interest. Uh, once it's come to Mr. Champa's attention, he needs to just apply the law. Uh, it is it is it would be nice to think through some improvements to procedure to avoid the situation coming up that came up in this kind of situation. I don't know whether 
there's anything really that 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 can be done about that. Uh, but it is un, it is unfortunate that 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 the the appellant is in the situation that she's in. Uh, but I'm not. I don't really see the relief that we can. Any relief that we can provide to her, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont. So I do have a question for the appellant, and um, it may not be all that relevant. But is this something that a contractor constructed, or is this something that the homeowners did themselves? Okay. I hire the uh, contractor. The contract says fine. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's abide with the uh, building code. So that's my. I actually had two contractor, different contractor. They both said it's, it's okay. Because I I don't have the house behind my uh backyard. Uh, technically no setback requirement. So uh, my contractor said it's okay. That's why uh. Because mm -hmm. doesn't require permit to enter state law, and I checked the online building code of Arlington doesn't mention anything about the shed, and we never get informed about the town's bylaw about the shed. I never, I I never get informed about that. That's why. So we just go ahead. Just um, the contract just started. Just it's a kit. It's bought by from Home Depot. So mm -hmm. they, they simply just put it together. They're not really um, just cut wood or something. They just put but it together. If if I may, then so did did the subject of the setback come up, and the contractor then said that it met the setback requirement? Yeah, they said it's fine. That's what they told me. Because I I would say to Mr. Champa, I mean my my thinking is. And, and I agree with Mr. Hanlon, I'm not sure what relief we could offer, but you know, it strikes me that people who put up fences or sheds or those sorts of things in town would ordinarily be tasked with knowing what the setback requirements are and uh, or if there are setback requirements. And, and so I, I don't know what the solution is to make sure that people who are doing whatever they're doing without building permits are are made aware of the fact that there's still a setback that has to be considered. Um, but it does strike me that this may have been a missed um, opportunity for somebody to have actually looked into this more carefully on behalf of the homeowner. But Mr. And Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? I just build on that for a second. It, it sounds to me, I mean, the, the reference to no, not being a setback because there's no house behind, of course, whether there's a house behind has actually has no bearing whatever on the zoning bylaw. The setback is there whether there's a house or not. Uh, I have this vague sense that whether there's a house nearby may have some significance under the building code and have the general feeling that whatever advice contractors gave were contractors relating to the state building code and they were not familiar with uh, uh, or were not focused on the the zoning bylaw. So I'm not sure Mr. LeBlanc knows a great deal about the building code, and I'm not quite sure where the business about having a setback with respect to a house behind you comes from. But I think the difficulty is often the case that contractors don't necessarily understand the local zoning bylaws. They understand what they need to understand about the building code, but th this is not a building code issue. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there other any other comments from the board? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and open up the, this uh, hearing for public comment. Um, as said before, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, you may dial, you may, if you're calling in, you can dial star nine. If you are online, you can use the raise hand. Uh, button on the reactions tab. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Just uh, one question. I uh, was reading the materials that support this, and I had a question. 
Well, I wanted to ask a question of the app uh, appellant. Uh, it looked from pictures that one of the uh, abutters submitted that another shed is built, being built in the opposite corner of this lot, also up against the property line. Um, I, I guess I would at first ask, is that true? Uh, I, I Oh, I think she froze. I think her window froze. Yeah. yeah. Give a second for it to clear sure. up. Uh oh, nope. Oh, there you go. It's Kim. I'm so sorry. Your your window froze on us for a bit there, and it put you back into mute. So if you could go ahead and unmute and re respond back to that question, I apologize. Oh, okay. Okay. So I do need. I I'm just saying. Uh, the only I have one little shed, one little bigger shed, two put out together. The size only one fifth of my, my basement uh space. Mm -hmm. I I have living here almost twenty years. My basement full of junk, but uh, some stuff like his stuff I don't want to throw it away. So mm -hmm. I, I just I just want to put it somewhere uh, as memory. So this is why I need I do need the space. But they are both uh, the shed kit. I. I ordered from the Home Depot and I hire uh, two actually different contractors. One to do the foundation and the one just uh, put them together. Both okay. of them told me it's okay. I actually, I do ask them, is this a uh, building, it's okay with the building code? They said, it's, uh, uh, both of them say fine. And two different contractors. So that's why I check online that uh, it's, a, uh, it's an, uh, the state, uh, state law, Massachusetts mm -hmm. state law uh, said under 200 square feet doesn't require permit. So, and the um, building code of the Arlington doesn't even mention the shed. So that's why I just go ahead and do it. I didn't even, I mean, I didn't expect such a thing happen. And also then uh, only my neighbors uh, complain is only because he saw the uh, uh, shed, the roof of the shed. It's really no other serious issue about the safety or a house or something like that. Just that he saw the roof. But if but the order of the inspector will make that, as I said, if I move it forward six feet, will worsen the complaint of the neighbor because the neighbor can uh, see much more roof because much more, because he's kind of behind on the side. If I move them forward to the shed, the neighbor can see more roof. So it's a worse in the complaint. Okay. So is it just is it just the one shed or is there a second shed that's being no considered? second no second not even put up yet. Okay. Uh, second is a small one. And uh, okay. when the stop, then the shed second one doesn't even get a chance to to do okay. that. Okay. Thank Here's you, Mr. Very Chairman. Much. Um Mr. Hamlin. We since since we don't know anything about the second shed. It's entirely possible that the second shed might be under 80 square feet, mm -hmm. uh, in which case it would be a very different case. So <clears throat> this is not really before us. The, Mr. Trompa hasn't made any orders with respect to that. Uh, yeah. But there is an option if if an 80 square foot shed will be a value, uh, then the position, the uh, 5.3.13 would excuse that from compliance with the setback requirement. As long as the height was reduced. As long as the height was, well, yes, right. As long as the height was reduced. Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. And uh, had we not had the, the frozen time there, I would have uh, uh, mentioned that as well. I understand that the size of whatever's going, and it's not even before you tonight, but I, I was going to ask Mr. Champa, based on whether or not that was a second shed going up, about what the limitations of that would be. And I think he probably would have echoed what you just said, Mr. Hamlin. So um, anyway, that's that's enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any members, other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment for this hearing. Um, 
So the matter at hand before the board this evening, um, it is an appeal of the decision of the building inspector. Uh, the decision of the, the building inspector has um, directed the, the appellant that the shed that was constructed is too close to the property line and uh, this is not compliant with the zoning bylaw and has um, directed the appellant to comply with the zoning bylaw, which would require uh, either relocating the shed or um, some other modification in order to comply with uh, what the zoning bylaw requires. Are there, and um, as we've been discussing, um, we had read the sections out of the, the local zoning bylaw uh, in regards to sheds and accessory structures. Um, we've had a comment back and forth. Are there, is there any other questions or comments from members of the board? Um, seeing none, I think as, as has been put forward, um, you know, un unfortunately for the, for the appellant, I think the, the zoning bylaw is fairly clear in what's required. And it's unfortunate that the, uh, the contractors with, with, um, who you relied upon, uh, were, you know, ill-informed about what the zoning bylaw requirements are for the town of Arlington, um, but the, as Mr. Hamlet has said, the board does not have a lot of discretion um, in terms of uh, not um, not enforcing portions of the zoning bylaw where we are required to enforce the zoning bylaw. And um, as has been uh, put forward uh, by Mr. Hamlet, that our other option would be to consider a variance, uh, which would be the legal method for um, doing something different than what the zoning requires but the first there there are four tests that are enshrined in state law and the first is that there is some unique condition relating to the lot uh to the soil conditions to the topography or to the shape that would preclude abiding by the zoning bylaw and the, the as we had shown at the start the lot it's a rectangular lot it's fairly flat um and so there's really there's not a there's not a a way for the board to adopt that first um that first charge that we would that first finding that we would need to make um and so i, I would uh put ask the board um but i i think that i would put forward to the board um a motion to deny the appeal of the decision of the building inspector second if that's the appropriate thank you mr hanlon <clears throat> so this is a vote a roll call vote of the board uh the motion is to deny the appeal of the building inspector in regards to 186 overlook road uh mr dupont aye mr hanlon aye mr holly aye um we'll go with miss uh miss hoffman aye and the chair votes aye so um do we the appeal of the building inspector is denied um with apologies to the to the appellant i know it's not what you were hoping for but unfortunately the uh, the zoning bylaw is clear in this regard mr chairman mr hanlon just one of the things that we ought to take into consideration uh not in deciding this case we've just decided the case but in terms of um what went, what went wrong here um when the chair first set this the legal framework all out and started with the definition of a shed, uh, that then word never really came back into play. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever use it is to define it in the bylaw, it wasn't. It was never referred to as sort of somehow something different from an accessory building. I convinced that this came had no idea that what she had was called an accessory building for purposes of the zoning bylaw. And I'm sure that a good portion of the 45,000 people at Barlington don't, don't have any reason to know that any better than Ms. Kame did. It's, it's, you know, you have to live with the bylaw a, lot, a while in order to, in order to, uh, in order to understand what the right, what the right categories are. Um, there may be ways of making this clearer to learn from this sort of thing. But it, again, it's really important that the people whom citizens, uh, residents ask to help them just need to understand 
what the underlying rules are and they need and this, those are going to vary i don't think that there's anything particularly arlington about the concept of an accessory building uh but it's but ordinary people just don't don't have a reason to know that language and the people who are in the business do thank you i, I have my post-it note to uh to talk with um see if there's a way that we can try to publicize this better with these requirements. Okay, with that, um, so that item is, so now we move uh, back to item number six on our agenda tonight, docket 37799 Morton Road. Um, if I could ask the applicants to introduce themselves and tell us what they're proposing. Hi there, thanks for having us tonight. Um, I'm Kate Gregorio. Um, my husband's also on the line. Um, Anthony Gregorio. Um, we live at Nine Morton Road. We um, started a project because we uh, need additional office space to work from our house with our growing family. Um, and we looked into building a structure in our backyard that we could use as a quote unquote backyard office. Um, we spoke to Colleen, who is incredibly helpful in helping us um, figure out what we were trying to do. And she suggested that we actually look into the building code for an ADU. Um, so looking into that, we realized that we could not only potentially build ourselves a backyard office, but also um, a dwelling unit in which um, any of our parents uh, may be able to come and live with us at some point, should that be a need, which is um, something we are very much living with um, as, a, as a sandwich generation, if you will. Um, and so we um, we looked into how to do this, and um, we'd like to do it through um, a company who builds backyard offices. Um, they are not a general contractor, which is why we've filled out this um, permit application ourselves and done, done the legwork ourselves. So apologies if anything is um, out of place. Happy to adjust as needed. Um, but what we'd like to do is build a 10 by 20 a unit which meets I think the ADU definition because we'd like to include a bathroom in it and electricity um, and due to the shape of our lot here at Nine Morton Road um, the back of the lot narrows to 27 feet in width and so it'd be really hard to fit that 20 um, foot wide ADU in that area if we had to abide by the six foot setbacks and what we would end up with is three and a half feet approximately. Um, so we have applied both a, both a special permit and a variance application. I think we now have submitted through um, through the application process. Um, and the main reason is, you know, everything else about the ADU and our open usable space um, falls wall falls well within the ADU guidelines. So really the only um, variance or special circumstances would be those setbacks. Um, and so that is why we are here today. And Christian, if there are any additional images or plans that I can pull up on my end that would help mm -hmm. illustrate, just let me know and I'm happy to do so. Great, thank you very much. Um, so quickly, so, um, go ahead and share. So this is, um, the location here on Morton Road. Yep. Um, and as the applicant described, their lot is oddly shaped. Um, and so they are looking to uh, construct here in this rear portion. Um, oops, that's not what I'm looking for. That's the button. Um, and so one can see that there's this is a the, sort of the portion of it's where the backyards all come together. So there is there are no other residential structures immediately adjacent um, in this area of the of their site. Um, this is a, a revised plot plan that has been provided, um, which shows the location of the structure here at the rear of the lot. Uh, so it's four feet off the rear lot line, four feet off the sideline. Um, located here at the very rear of the structure. Um, and the um, and this was the provided uh, rendering of the outside of the uh, of the proposed uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, are there any floor plans of the of the building or any plans with dimensions apart from just the current size listing? 
Um, we have a floor plan that we have literally drawn ourselves in PowerPoint that we'd be happy okay. to share. Um, it doesn't have um, very specific dimensions, but I can pull it up nonetheless. And I have one other um, image that might be useful. So let me get so, those for you. Yeah. So Colleen, if you can give her the permission to share. Good. Okay. So this is what we're looking at um, in terms of sort of how how we're going to use the space. So um, 10 by 20 with the bathroom aligned to the left-hand side with just a toilet, a stall, and a sink, um, and then sort of a, a couch and a table um, and, and a sort of kitchen counter area. So pretty simple, um, small space, but we're trying to make the most of the potential uses for it. Okay. And then um, I can also share, I thought this might be interesting to see just where, um, given Mr. Moore's um, comments and questions, we've also been thinking a little bit about um, the plantings and the, and the bushes and such that are in and around the property. And that's one of the reasons that we kind of wanted to nestle it back here because we have some- oh, Sorry, we still, we're, unfortunately, we're still seeing the floor plan of the- Oops, of no, the let me stop and I think and you need restart. to- No problem. <laughs> Here we go. Um, that's kind of why we wanted to nestle it back here in this corner is because there are several um, nice big trees in the area that we don't want to mess with, obviously. Um, okay. So I thought I'd share that too. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, how, how does one get from the street to where you're proposing? The primary way of accessing will be through, you know, coming out of our back porch. We have a patio mm -hmm. here um, and we'll probably put in some like little pavers just back along here. Okay. Um, if there is some sort of requirement to have a path from the front, we do have a path already that comes just to the edge of our fence, which is located here. And we could continue that path if that was a necessary thing. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't know if that's a requirement or not. Um, but just, I just wanted to make sure because it is located so far from the, from the street that there would, you know, that should emergency services need to access the building, that they have a path that they can get there. Understood. Yep. Um, I think just in general, just for, so, um, should the board approve the project? One of the things, um, because it's a special permit, it needs to be registered with the registry of deeds. Um, and so you will need to provide uh, a certified plot plan with the location, final location of the building as a part of that application um, to the Registry of Deeds. So just let you know about that. Um, about that. Okay, so we'd have a, a new um, inspector come out and do a certified plot plan. So I think, yeah, so you'd need to have the surveyor just survey, surveyor, the, sorry. survey yep. it. Um, and then one of the boards, uh, I, this, I think it's a, a question more, probably more for the board, but um, does the does the board feel comfortable with the level of detail we have on the proposed building to uh, proceed to a decision or does the board feel that it needs um, more detailed drawings that we can approve and then that the that the building department can follow um, going forward so that that's just something for the board to keep in mind. Um, so if I could ask you to go ahead and, and close the share, and then I will ask members of the board uh, if they have any questions or comments for on this uh, application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So <clears throat> I wonder if, if Ms. Gregorio can explain a little bit more what uh, they imagine the use of this building being. It, it seems like it will be for the foreseeable future and office and might eventually be used as a residence if the circumstances should arise. Uh, but I wonder if there's any more specificity that you can provide to that. Is there any certainty that this will ever be used as a residential unit? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, can't say for sure, um, you know, uh, but right now, um, <clears throat> let me back up. Um, immediately upon construction, it'll be used as a daily office for either my husband or myself. We both work full time um, from home. Um, we work, you know, it's just an office for us and our computer. It's not for anybody coming to it. 
Um, it would just be for us. Um, and that'll be the primary use case. But by installing the bathroom, what we think we're doing is giving ourselves leeway for if and when either one of us may have a parent who may need to come live with us. Um, I have a mom who is um, on her way to being unable to live alone by herself. And I would love to be able to offer this for either a short time period um, or an extended time period, should that become necessary. I hope that's not the case, um, but you know, can't say for sure. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc. Um, I guess kind of going to your point um, about, you know, just kind of looking at the definitions we have for an accessory dwelling unit um, and do we have enough information in front of us to, you know, make that decision. Um, the one point I get hung up on when looking at the information that we have so far in front of us is um, the final bullet point under the accessory dwelling unit um, part of the zoning bylaw, so 5.9.2B1, the final bullet point there, um, just about it complying with all of the state building codes and um, for both the building code and the fire code. Um, just with the information we have in front of us, I don't, you know, that's obviously for Mr. Trump to, and the building department mm -hmm. to determine. Um, but I'm not sure that they would have enough information with what we have to make that determination, um, especially with the building being closer to the lot line. Um, I think of, you know, the other part of our zoning bylaw for garages that we have with the um, the type of construction for a more fire rated construction, since they're typically closer to lot lines. Um, you know, just thinking about that part of the bylaw as well. Yeah. Um, and that. Um, you know, very much in favor of of wanting to to do this. Just kind of going to your point of the, do we have enough information in front of us? Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, I'm <clears throat> I'm in the unusual position of being concerned about this application when with with ADU applications generally, I seem to I have a tendency to be the other way. Um, I'm concerned about whether this is, in fact, an ADU. Uh, and so going back to the definitions, an accessory dwelling unit is defined as a self-contained housing unit, inclusive of sleeping, cooking, and sanitary facilities on the same lot as a principal dwelling. So it has to have all these other things, the sleeping and cooking and sanitary facilities, but you can have lots of accessory buildings that have all of those things and that doesn't make them accessory dwelling units unless they're actually being used as a housing unit. Uh, when you look at the definition of a, develop, a dwelling unit, it's a separated portion of a building containing living, sleeping, housekeeping accommodations and sanitary facilities for occupancy by one household. Um, but this the only occupancy that is reasonably certain here is occupancy occupancy by the residents of the principal dwelling. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we're so liberal about what an ADU is mm -hmm. that anyone who wants to build an office or an art studio or whatever could build an accessory unit, put the stuff in the back with this thought that, you know, maybe if they're old like me, we don't have parents anymore, but, you know, we could get a student as a, or a care to, care gift giver to eventually come in if we need it, but it's all speculative and what it really is is an office. I'm not sure what I think about that, but I wanted to raise that with the board and to see if others uh, are have have some some concerns that this is maybe stretching the ADU ordinance a bit far. Mr. Mr. Chair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. LeBlanc, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, I, I kind of agree with, with uh, Mr. Hamlin on that. I think that's kind of where I was starting to go with, with my previous point. Um, you know, just with the the things that we've seen, I'm not sure if it really meets the, you know, what a dwelling unit should be. And um, there might be maybe other options to look at if what you're really trying to get at is in, you know, a separate space for an office or something. Mr. Chairman, if I could just point out that that 
it may very well be that if we decided that this that the ADU ordinance didn't apply, that this is actually an appropriate case for variance after all. It, at the very least, that what we're dealing with here is the potential of the shape of the lot being significant, and that 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 is a first step that often people can't take. So, I'm not sure that we would have to say no ultimately to building this building, or building it where it is, um, if we concluded it wasn't an ADU. I'm I just I'm just perplexed about this. I'm not going to be an advocate one way or the other on this, but I'm a little bit concerned about the precedent that it sets. Ms. Hoffman? Uh, I was just going to say that I it also feels perhaps like it's not an ADU to me. Uh, but um, in addition to that, coming to the point that maybe um, Mr. Hanlon was just coming to about the location of it, the structure, I have, I have another concern with regards to the variance. And that's... Um, with regards to the rear setback. Mm -hmm. um, if we look back up at the at the plot plan that uh, was showing the dimensions, I think, are we seeing th a 3.5 foot setback on each side? It's definitely, it's four at the side. That's four to the corner, but I think on the application it says 3.5 to the- It's possible that this Diagonal here would be tighter. So on the application, um, it says three point. I, I think the rear setback may be three point five. Maybe perhaps the applicant could confirm. Yeah, this um, particular site plan was something we had drawn up before we found our certified plot plan to include with the application. So this is actually out of date. Um, we don't okay. have. Yeah. So basically the back width of the lot is 27 feet and the building width is 20 feet and so that's where the three and a half on each side number came okay. from understood um it actually it was helpful to have that plan up to for me to complete my point which is that <laughs> it seems very reasonable to me with um the the odd shape of the site that you, you would need relief for the um both side um setbacks but it's not clear to me that the rear setback couldn't be six feet. If I'm just looking at this plan, is, is there a reason that the... Yeah, our primary reason is because there's a couple of trees that we don't want to have to take down for... Well, well there's a couple of um, trees and bushes and other kinds of landscaping that we don't want to have to move. Um, but primarily, we just... Um, we want it to to be kind of tucked away and not intrusive in the yard and not intrusive for the view of our neighbors, not, not just not as um, close to the, like the homes that are in the area. Um, that was the primary like initial reason, but you're, you're right. Like there's no um, structural reason or like a lot line reason. Um, one other small thing is that the slope of our land, that's the highest point in our yard. And according to the plumbers that we've been talking to in order to plumb um, a toilet out there, we need to have a certain slope meet from where the um, where the um, AD or building is to where it connects to our sewer. And so the further back up against that hill um, we can go, the higher the more likely we'll be able to meet that slope, but that's sort of a, a sub point. Okay, well, I, I think that answers my question, except for maybe I'd be curious to see, and I apologize if it already came up in the application materials, where the um, trees of concern are located exactly, if it would be possible in any way to, to move the structure forward without disrupting them. Yeah, I can go back to sharing that one. Yeah, please. if you could show that again, please. No problem. Yeah. This is sort of, um, we will, we'll have to remove um, a couple of bushes, but right now there's like a, a wood shed that's back here that we'll just tear down um, and a big boulder that we'll have to move. Um, and then we're trying to keep a lilac bush that's like right here. And then these are um, other types of shrubs, bushes, and trees. 
So that's why we're not proposing that we just like put it, you know, 90 degrees to where the proposed is on this drawing. Mr. Chair. Ms. Hoffman. I think this plan is helpful, but it doesn't necessarily um, confirm that it would be impossible to comply with the six foot setback in the rear without disrupting trees. So it might be useful to have a little more clarity around that. Yeah, it, might be, um, it might be possible to rotate it 90 degrees and sort of set it six feet off. It, it would fit six feet off of all the lines if it was rotated. Uh, like putting it here, basically. Yeah. In that area. And turned and put there, then it would mm -hmm. be... It would be an accessory yeah. structure and it would meet the setback requirements. Um, we may be able to do that. I think like, you know, aesthetically for our backyard and, you know, we're very visible. Yeah. Well, ish to our neighbors. Um, we're just trying to keep it tucked away right now. This is sort of like unused space. We have two little kids who play in the yard here. They have a little climbing structure. The neighborhood is full of kids who are constantly in and out of each other's backyards. We're just trying to maintain the sort of backyard yeah. play space. Um, I, I don't think that we would go through with it if we had to put it okay here. All right. But um, totally appreciate the the feedback. It's totally valid, and we can definitely experiment with what what it would look like if we put it a full six feet from at least the back line, which okay. would also put it a little further from this line as this angles out. Happy to look at that. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, I, mean, I I guess that's sort of before the question. You know, what if it's an accessory dwelling unit and it's set it meets the requirements as an accessory dwelling unit, but it is not rented? Is it still an accessory dwelling unit? Um, Could I ask if there's a different kind of structure that we should have applied under? At first, we were looking at building yeah. a shed. Um, <laughs> so maybe we go back to building a shed because um, sheds have electricity and. In blue, that means we don't have the bathroom. I don't know. Um, so, the the definition. So the 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 limiting factor for a dwelling is is a stove. Is my understanding. So that if it doesn't have a stove, it's not a, a unit. Um, so you can have a garage with a with a restroom in it. That's allowed. Um, but you couldn't have a garage with a kitchen. Um, and the the stove being the defining characteristic of a kitchen. So. In theory, you could do that, um, but then it would not it would not be a shed because a shed is eighty square feet or less. Um, <laughs> but if it's up to two hundred square feet, um, it would just be an accessory building, and as such, it needs to be six, the only setback requirement is six feet off the rear and side. Um, and so, I think that you could, if it didn't have a kitchen in it then it could be considered an accessory building, but you would have to manipulate it so it is not within six feet of the property line. Would uh, we be able to apply for a variance on that? If it's if it is less than if it's less than 200 square feet, less than I think it said 20 feet in height and six feet off of the lines, I think you can build it by right. Uh, so you would not need a variance, you would not need a special permit. You could just build it. But you um that I would absolutely have you confirm that with the with the building inspector. Um, I think the question but, you were asking, oh, forgive me, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh, please, sir. I think the uh, what Kate was asking um, was just whether we would have to whether we could apply for a variance um, on the side setbacks um, if it's if it's if the application is for an accessory building rather than an accessory dwelling unit. Um, certainly. So there is a variance application filed. Um, and as Mr. Hanlon said, the, the there are different criteria for a variance, and one of them has to do with the shape of the land and whether there is something about the shape of the land that leads to a hardship, um, and that's something that the board would have to have to consider. Um, so, I at this point, I think it would be helpful if to open up for public comment just to see if there's other uh, 
if there are other uh, people who wish to speak to this. Um, so as we said before, um, I'm gonna open the meeting for public comment. Public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of helping inform our decision. Um, the, if you are calling in, you can dial star nine. If you are on Zoom, you may press the uh, raise hand button on the reactions tab. Uh, so with that, we have Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Not wanting to break my perfect strings of commenting on every single case, I figured <laughs> I'd have something to say. Um, I want to I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Hoffman's uh, for her comments about about the trees and the locations. I think that was uh, very thoughtful, and um, I had similar sorts of thoughts about uh, the movement of it and protection of the trees and the like. And also. Um, both Mr. LeBlanc and Mr. Hanlon, I love the way the board always thinks its way around corners. It was great to hear their input as well. Um, my point, I, I mean, I would just offer an opinion here, uh, and that's that a lot of this would not be an issue if this was simply rotated 90 degrees, moved slightly away from the rear plot line, uh, put as close to the... Um, the plot line that is the the trees on the other side of it, I believe they're owned by the owners, the property owners on the other side of the plot line. Um, and the space that then would not be occupied by the uh, ADU would now be opened up for a child play, pace, play space. It would re require a redesign of their, probably their backyard to accommodate what they want to do with play space and use of their lot and such. But it would not be very hard here to, uh, to, to nestle this a little bit less, but only a little bit less, still use that corner, odd corner of the property and actually be able to build it by right as as the as the chair already mentioned. Um, it really wouldn't be that hard to make this accommodated, uh, accommodated not by the zoning board, but just built by right. So that's just my, my rough opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, you're muted. Thank you very much. Are there other members of the public who wish to speak to this matter? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Um, so I think there's a couple of questions before the board. And I'm, no, sorry, I think my question back to the board is, do we have you know, the, do we have enough information at this time to move forward or do we, are there questions that we need answered? I think the 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 question before about whether or not an accessory, whether this would be an accessory dwelling unit if it was constructed as one, but used as a an office, would that go against the intent of the, of the zoning bylaw? Does the zoning, would the zoning bylaw allow that occupancy of the, um, of the unit and then based i think on that question then other then we can have sort of the idea about you know do we does do do they need to seek a variance for constructing an accessory building in the location it's in um or would it be worthwhile to um to rotate and relocate so that it would not need to uh, meet the setback requirements and could also um, would then also have to have to be constructed without a a stove, um, so that would not be a dwelling unit. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I think that that you've stated the issue well. I think that part of the problem, however, would be. If suppose we suppose it was decided, I mean, again, my concern has to do with the language that it has to be a housing unit, and mm -hmm. that means inclusive of these various things, but it has to be used for housing. And to be sure, that doesn't mean it only has to be used for housing, or or, or there's no any period, but there's no definite plan here to ever use it as housing. It's just a contingency. Uh, and that's to me, that's what's giving me some difficulty in applying the definition. The, the definition of the dwelling unit is for a is a residence for a household, and uh, there's no household that's proposed to be to be put in here. So that creates 
a difficulty for me. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, uh, uh, but I'm concerned about it because I'm concerned that that anyone who has uh, wants to do an accessory dwelling unit for any purpose and and wants to get closer to the to a, a lot line would be in a position to say what it well I could eventually use this as an ADU. Um, so that that's that. If you were going for a variance, I think you do have an issue with the shape of the lot that that constrains certain options. I think that the unwillingness that then the question is whether whether that would occasion an unreasonable hardship, whether you could move it someplace else. And and yes, it's physically possible to do this. You could stick this right in right up next to the house if you wanted to. Uh, but the question is whether the solutions involve an unreasonable hardship. And Ms. Hoffman's questions, I think, were related in, in part to that. And Mr. Moore's comments, how easy would this be to do? And what other sacrifices would have to be made in order in order to do it? Um, so the structure, it's always hard to get a variance, but but at least here you have, at least in my view, some elements that we have working for this but I think we need more information to actually evaluate whether whether the ways in which um, you could you could get around this and, and put this in here and observe the six feet, whether those uh, are have disadvantages that would prevent this from being an unreasonable hardship or not. Mr. Moore expressed the opinion that this would be relatively easy to do, but also only if you completely redesign your backyard. And Ms. Hoffman has raised some other questions about that, and we don't really know exactly what the trees are that are there. So I'm not sure how I would feel about that, but but you know that sort of is the the way one can do it as a variance if you were able to make that. I, in my personal view, and I'm I'm probably one of the hardest people on variance applications on this board, but I actually feel a little bit more comfortable with the variance analysis than I do if the facts are right mm -hmm. than I do with the ADU which seems to me to open up the ADU bylaw to a, a potential for abuse I'm not saying that this isn't abusive particularly but you know if, if this got to be a regular thing for accessory units it could be a problem um, so I don't know I I just I, I think that having an, enough information about what it would be like what would be what would be the downside? Where are the trees? What is what does you actually lose? What do you lose in terms of the ability to use your lot in the way that that is sensible and and and, and intended? Um, if that added up to something, then I think that that I'd be attracted by it. But you know, I again, I'm 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 not. A, I don't feel I, I'm concerned about this, but not not enraged or excited mm -hmm. about it in, in in the sense that I feel like this has got to happen in a certain way or not. Uh, but I think I mean, that we do need to be building for the rest of for the future here. I mean, to play devil's advocate, so I have a two family house. If I live in one of my units and I use the other unit as a home office, is that still, is it no longer a, a two family house because I'm not using the other unit for a residential purpose? Uh, I, well, don't think that but, would be the case. But the use classification should not change. The ADU yep. should not change the use classification of the property too, right? Right. Right. That's I don't great. know. It just said the dwelling unit definition says a separated portion of a building containing living, sleeping, housekeeping, accommodations, and sanitary facilities for occupancy by one household. Yeah. And what you're saying is, well, suppose I don't choose to actual, I still leave it the way it is, but I choose to use it as an artist studio or whatever. Uh, does that mean it's not for occupancy by one household? It, it mm -hmm. seems, I mean, I, I, I'll leave that up to Mr. Webster to figure out what, what that is. I don't think anyone is really con contemplating this. This uh, is Gregorio, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that we are entirely happy to remove the ADU classification. Um, we don't need this to be an ADU. We thought that it might be um, 
it might fit squarely into the guidance provided for ADUs, but if that's not the case, we can entirely remove, take that off the table. We're happy to reapply for a variance as a mm -hmm. accessory building. Um, the the bylaws are definitely a little challenging to understand um, as a as a um, common citizen. So we we latched onto that because we thought it made sense, but right. it's not a requirement for the project at all. So, so Mr. Mr. Chair, just to I wouldn't. I wouldn't be hit precipitous there. I I'd, I'd leave both options on the tables until we are able to proceed. Right. You can you can leave them. I mean the building the, the building is actually one one thing or the other, right? Uh mm -hmm. but you can you have to sort of decide which way you want to go, but I wouldn't necessarily make a decision now on one thing that maybe others members of the board would, are attracted to uh mm -hmm. in order to take a road on a variance issue which is always a little bit harder the so i know do, just so leave it all before you, us and let us work it out yeah as i say do you suggest that maybe we need to um have a sit down with the zoning enforcement officer and sort of discuss the how this should be considered? Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other comments from the members of the board? Um, so I think with the applicant's permission, I think the board would request a continuance um, so that we could have that conversation with the zoning enforcement officer and sort of clarify exactly how we need to categorize this so we, we're sure we're making a decision that you know that, that is in the best interest of all parties um the next scheduled hearing we have is tuesday february 13th is that a, a date that's available for you forgive us just confirming yep no absolutely yes time. yes absolutely okay yep that should be okay for me okay for us um, <laughs> So then with that, I would um, recommend that I would then move uh, that we continue uh, the hearing for 9 Morton Road to Tuesday, February 13th at 7.30 p.m. Second. And then a vote of the uh, vote of the board. Um, so Mr. Dupont uh, had to leave us. Um, Mr. Hanlon, aye. Mr. Holly, aye. Ms. Hoffman, aye. Mr. LeBlanc, aye. Chair votes aye. We are continued on uh, Nine Morton Road, and the, the we will have a conversation with the zoning enforcement officer and get to the bottom of this and. Uh, get back to you as soon as we're able. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Mr. you both Chairman. for your time. Appreciate, Appreciate the time. Mr. Absolutely. Chairman, thank you, board board members. Thank you. And um, I'm sorry for ha have one last clarifying question. Yeah, um, please. Mr. Hanlon, I think you mentioned additional clarifying information that would be helpful. I, I just want to understand if that information would be helpful before the next um, hearing on February 13th or whether that's information we would follow on with after you have the opportunity to sit down with the zoning enforcement officer. So I, I think that we would meet with the zoning enforcement officer as soon as we can and get back to you. Right. Um, if there's additional information that he feels will be relevant, then we can we can let you know ahead, well okay. ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Good night. Good night. Okay. So this brings us back to uh, item uh, seven R in our agenda, docket 3782-53 Lansdowne Road. Um, First, appreciate the patience uh, of the applicants, um, and if they could go ahead and introduce themselves and let us know what they're looking to do. Hi, uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Nolan uh, from Savoy Nolan Architects. I'm here representing uh, Tim and Becker Center. Uh, they're the owners of 53 Lansdowne Road. Also with me tonight is uh, David Crispin of the BSC Group. Uh, he's our civil engineer, and Russ uh, 
Busa of Sterling Homes Development Corp, who's the, the general contractor. Um, is it possible for me to share my screen? Absolutely. Uh, Colleen, can you connect Mr. Nolan? Okay. Thank you, Colleen. Um, can everybody see the site plan? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'll just walk you through the existing conditions. So this is the existing site plan of the existing conditions. Um, it's a small uh, Cape style shingle, uh, uh, Cape style uh, single family residence built in 1940. It's one and a half stories, uh, contains two bedrooms, and it has about 1370 uh, square feet finished living area. Uh, we're in an R1 zone. The property is uh, 7,000 uh, 61 square feet with about 110 feet of frontage on Lansdowne Road. Uh, the building, the existing building is non-conforming with respect to uh, the left uh, setback and the front uh, Lansdowne streets here. I apologize. Uh, this will be the only plan oriented this way. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll draw it to your attention when, when we switch. Um, uh, but uh, to continue, uh, it's not conforming with the uh, left side setback here, which is uh, three foot eight from this porch here and uh, nine foot two from the front setback. Um, I believe it's it's um, conforming with all of the respects to the um, uh, dimension and density regulations. Um, here's the, the building here. I wanted to point out two other things. Um, the the existing driveway is very steep and very narrow. It's hard to park a car there. And the garage is actually quite quite narrow too, um, although they do manage to get a car in there. And uh, I also just wanted to point out the, you know, this is the side setback here. We're very close to the, uh, to the fence, which is essentially the property line. Um, we're also in this next, uh, Group here. This is the back of the yard. I had uh, the the clients take some pictures this morning or this afternoon, um, just to kind of show uh, the setback here um, of the existing house. Um, these this tree line right here is essentially the property line. It's a little bit further behind, and you've got a series of um, two and a half story houses over here, um, kind of flanking it. So we're one of the design. Um, uh, request was not to not to get too close to those houses because they're already kind of um, um, approaching the backyard. Um, basic floor plans. I won't spend too much of your time on on these. I uh, just got a small kind of narrow garage. It's only about nine and a half feet wide. Uh, unfinished basement. You've got um, a bedroom um, on the first floor. Uh, kind of an open living dining room and a kitchen kind of tucked away here in the corner and a small mudroom. This is the front of the house here, and this is the uh, nine foot two front setback. And the second floor has a standard cape, um, no dormers, uh, it's just kind of like a, a tunnel room, uh, one big room here and a small room that's used as an office. It's listed on the um, it's listed on the property card as a two, two bedroom. I suppose you could argue that it's three beds. Um, moving on to the, uh, proposed conditions. What we're proposing to do is um, take down the house, take down the existing house and create a new um, single family uh, wood frame structure. It'll be a two and a half story um, uh, colonial style with four bedrooms and a single car underneath garage. Uh, in design, we re referred to the uh, Arlington residential design guidelines to take some cues on, on the, um, the style of it and the architecture obviously with the, um, the, the owner's um, project goals in mind as well. Um, some of the key things that we hit on is, is encouraging consistent setbacks with the neighbors, uh, entrance uh, facing the street uh, and a walkway from the driveway. Uh, I'll get into the, uh, the design of it, but the proportion of the entry was also something that we paid particular um, uh, time uh, to, to kind of work out. Um, I'll get into that actually when, when I start to show you some of the um, the drawings. Uh, there'll be a small um, uh, uh, single car garage, more generous than the one that's there. It'll be a comfortable to pull in a car, uh, but there'll be a single car garage here. 
And um, we've actually, um, we're proposing to uh, increase the size of the driveway to, to allow for two off-street parking spaces, as opposed to the, the one that's currently available. And even that one's a little sketchy because of the, um, the um, uh, slope of the, um, the driveway. If I could just go back real quickly. This doesn't really do it justice, but you can see a kind of a hump here. It's fairly flat there, then it dives um, to get underneath the existing um, uh, first floor. That's about a 10% slope, which is about the maximum that the, the code allows. Um, so in this effort, we're going to um, uh, change that. And we've actually uh, got it down to a 3% slope, uh, which is significantly more comfortable. Um, so we think that those are all good things, promoting off-street parking or encouraging more off-street parking. Um, the other things that we're improving um, are the, the um, regarding the dimensional setbacks is we're eliminating the nonconformity of the side setback, uh, which is at 3.8 um, feet, and we're going to make that conforming, and we've got that slightly over the, the 10 feet. So I'm, I've got it shown here at 10 foot um, 6 plus or minus um, uh, from the side setback. So that's a, that's a big, big win. Uh, we are asking, and the reason why we're here tonight is we are asking for some relief on the front setback. Um, we're proposing um, a covered porch, and you'll see that in, in the drawings to come, uh, with a front setback of 11 foot 6, and the main building with a setback of 16 foot 6, where 25 is required. Um, I, I met with the, um, the I reviewed the bylaws and met with the building inspector regarding the, the rear setback and there's a, um, a regulation uh, or an exception in, in the in the um, in the table of, of uh, dimensional requirements that allows uh, a lot that's less than 100 feet deep to um, you know have a 20 percent 20 percent so I, I've done the math on that and we've come up to be uh, a rear setback of 12. Foot nine, so we will be conforming to that. In fact, I believe we'll be conforming um, to every uh, setback, uh, every um, uh, section <clears throat> under the the um, uh, dimensional and uh, density regulations, including the um, yards, open space, um, usable space, landscape, all that, uh, with the exception to the front yard setback, which we'll we'll get into. Um, floor plans here. Uh, again, I won't spend too much time going through them. One car garage, it's going to be 14 feet wide. So that'll be plenty of, of comfortable space to get a car in there and a little bit of, uh, you know, storage bikes, things like that. There'll be a, a, a mechanical uh, room back here. And the rest of the basement, with the exception of the mudroom um, and bathroom, will be uh, unfinished, um, potentially finished at a later date. Uh, the second floor, uh, the first floor, sorry, um, Entering through the mudroom, you'll come up uh, to kind of an open area or guests will come in through the covered porch into the entry, dining room to the left, open kitchen, um, living room space to the right, access to the backyard through a small covered porch down to a patio and a small little um, potter room off to the side. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Uh, we're also proposed, proposing a, um, a bulkhead off, off to the back, which you see here. On the second floor, uh, continuing up the stairs, we have uh, um, a uh, their son's bedroom. Uh, his name's Luke, uh, and this is also going to double as a um, uh, a secondary master. Uh, the centers are actually young uh, now, but as you know, everybody's getting older. So um, their primary bedroom we're putting on the uh, on the attic level, uh, but this gives them the option uh, way down the road if they decide that they want to move. Um, down and not not go up the extra uh, flight of stairs to have the um, a secondary master here and Luke reaps the benefits of that um, uh, <laughs> being the only child at this point uh, and then there's two guest bedrooms with a, um, a shared bathroom um, kind of tucked in the corner back here um, they're also quite busy and they do work from home I don't think it's exclusively at home but they do work from home as a lot of people do nowadays um, so we provided an office and kind of this open loft area for uh, homework, uh, reading, things like that, and then a laundry room. And then the last level, the attic level, um, and I did confirm with the building department, and we are under the 50% um, um, rule for the second floor here, mm -hmm. uh, will be just the primary 
bedroom. Um, so the primary bedroom here with a balcony off of it uh, to the exterior, beautiful views of Arlington down there. We have a, a walk-in and two walk-in closets, his and her the walk-in closets and a primary bathroom. Uh, this space is really just the byproduct of a, of a sloped roof. Um, we're keeping everything under seven feet and it'll be un, unfinished. Um, so this is unhabitable space, therefore not, not included in the, um, in the square footage calculation. However, um, because the, their intent is to use it for some storage, uh, we do have a uh, door off of the, um, uh, off of the uh, staircase uh, to get in there. I'm gonna fast forward um, through the, the uh, elevations because I have models which I think are, are better um, to see that, see, see the exterior on, and I can come back to them if there are any questions. The only thing I did wanna point out is we calculated the average grade to be uh, 220. Uh, 35 feet up would put us at about 225. We are proposing to get pretty close to the maximum there. Um, uh, it's customary for us to to um, at least leave at least four inches just just to give the builders some some um, some room. Uh, but the intent of this is to apply uh, um, that that we meet the the height regulations. And uh, the three dimensional models, which I think are a little bit easier to understand. So this is uh, the front perspective of Lansdowne Street coming up. You'll see the garage there, and I know it's not quite easy to see uh, in the models and in the picture, but this is a significantly reduced slope. Again, 3%, um, a little bit wider driveway. So again, two, we'll have three spaces for off-street parking. Um, this is the entrance that we came up with. Uh, again, trying to take cues from the design standards to, to have a front facing entrance and, um, and kind of make a statement with it. However, and we spent, I spent a lot of the design uh, time working with the centers to come up with uh, a, a porch that um, is not overpowering, uh, but in proportion with the with the scale of the building. And I think we arrived at that. We're also obviously, because we're asking for some relief on the front, uh, didn't want to get too big with it either. So trying to strike that balance between a, um, um, you know, a, a smaller porch that fits the scale of the building. Um, it's a colonial style uh, with a couple modern um, tweaks to it. Um, so the, um, the covered entrance, uh, we have, we're proposing a, a low roof over the garage. Um, we're proposing it to be a, a metal roof. Uh, this is the kitchen over the sink, the window. So we're, we're building on a box out window. Um, most clients like that because it offers a, um, an extended sill beyond the sink for herbs, things like that. Uh, and it's a nice detail, kind of breaks up a fairly flat facade on, on the, um, on the, uh, on the side on the side, but it's actually one, one it's probably the first, um, up, uh, as you're approaching up the hill in Lansdowne Road, um, this corner is the first thing that you'll see. So this is technically the front of the house, but this is also a very visible um, uh, part of the property in that there's a vacant lot in front that, that the centers owned and have combined. So there's a lot of green space in front of this. So this is a, 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 a facade that will, will be seen. Uh, you can see two dormers up here in the, the primary bedroom balcony, and then a small little uh, covered porch that will get you down to the patio. This is their outdoor space. This is where currently the outdoor space is. Uh, front elevation. Um, so again, just uh, the, the um, front entry, proposing a double door there, uh, a wood staircase coming down, and then it transitions into a landscape, like a granite staircase. And then um, the retaining walls to carve out the um, the garage under will we're proposing to be um, clad in stone. Uh, there'll be a smaller retaining wall from here. I may have got a little too aggressive with the stone. We're probably not going to carry the stone out to the street like this because it's not necessary. But there'll be a little bit of a wrapped um, retaining wall to retain this portion of the earth. Uh, we're doing that uh, based on your first uh, your first. Uh, meeting um, to keep the um, the basement uh, not as a story. So we're we're compliant with the uh, we're going to be less than the four foot six to the underside of ceiling uh, for the vast majority. The only place that we're not is is the small entrance for the garage. And then this is that uh, side. Uh, this is the right side, more more of an elevation shot showing the kitchen window, the um, 
uh, porch uh, leading out and then the balcony for the primary bedroom above. Um, I just wanted to give you a little history on, um, on, on the design of the project. So once we completed schematic design, I set up a meeting with the building inspector to review, um, uh, review the project. Because I, whenever, I, whenever we push kind of the max of height or, or really anything, I like to run it by the building department first, get their take on it and see if there's gonna be any, um, any issues. Um, so I met with the, um, the building inspector, we discussed the building height, uh, we reviewed the definition of a half story. Uh, the 20% rear setback is a new new um, regulation for me. So I wanted to be clear that I understood that. Um, and then uh, we went over the um, section 5.3.10, average setback exceptions for the front, um, which allows... Um, which allows an averaging of the front setbacks of 50%, you know, of the, of the existing developed lots on the street. Um, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult regulation, uh, not, not real intuitive. And it probably, if, if I'm frank, could be written a little clearer. So um, that one, we spent a lot of time talking about and, and the building inspector explained to me how, how they look at it. And if I could just, um, I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare a GIS map, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I don't know if it'll, does it allow me to share my screen? Yeah. You should still have permission. Yeah, I think I have permission, but it's not allowing me to share my screen. Oh, you don't see this, do you? Do you see a, no. a GIS map? No. Okay. Give me one, one more second. I'll try. Mr. Chairman. Yep. You were showing a GIS map earlier, uh, and I'm guessing that we could do that again if Mr. Nolan has a hard time to bring it up. Yeah. I am. Yeah, for some reason, it's not allowing me to share my screen. It's probably a safety thing. It's probably not a bad, <laughs> bad idea. All right, lands down 53. So I will go ahead. I can just share the GPS. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's great. Um, so as I was explaining, we were talking about section 5.3.10 uh, and the building inspector explained to us that it is uh, an average of the houses um, um, on, on the same side of the street between cross streets. So in our case, it's from Millet Street. Um, yeah, right there. And, and uh, there is no additional crossroads. So it's the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, so for our property, there's only two, well, there's really only one house that applies, but there's two houses on that, that block, if you will. Um, so we discussed the, the, how it, how it is, um, how it's interpreted. Uh, and that was, that was crystal clear. So what I did is I asked if, if we were able to, since there's only one other house on the lot, if we were able to use our house and the other house uh, to create an average. And at the time, the, um, the building inspector seemed to think that that was reasonable. Um, so I left with that, and, and if you take the um, if you take the average of our existing house and the uh, the op and, and fifty seven, it ends up being uh, just under twelve feet. So I rounded it up and I said, okay, so twelve feet will be our our front setback. Um, so we went through design, uh, ended up uh, uh, doing construction documents, and at the last minute, I just again wanted to touch base with the building department. And just make sure because we're getting ready to pull a building permit and I just wanted to you know make sure that there weren't going to be any snags and this time I spoke with uh, both the building inspector and the building commissioner and unfortunately the building commissioner had a different uh, interpretation of, of the regulation and that was also confirmed um, by the by the ZBA administrator assistant uh, Colleen um, so uh, and, and unfortunately 
we didn't we didn't meet um uh, there's a there's a, a clause in there that i didn't completely understand and we didn't really discuss in, in detail about a 50 uh, percent threshold and because there are um a couple undefined lots here uh, and only two houses on it um um we don't meet that 50 percent uh threshold so we don't qualify um for for 5.3.10 uh with the front yard setbacks in addition, um, uh, Mr. Champa uh, also said that it's it's uh, not customary for them to uh, allow the existing house to count towards. Well, in this case, he, he wasn't able to count the existing house towards it. So um, kind of both points made uh, the, the ability to use 5.3 as a um, uh, 0.10 as, as a uh, um, we didn't have that at, at, at our disposal. So I just want to be clear. I, I'm not saying that the building department misled us in any way or, or that, you know, uh, I'm not placing blame on anything. I'm just trying to explain to the to the board that we were doing our due diligence. We're trying to work within the, um, the bylaws. The bylaws mm -hmm. are tricky, particularly this one, too. And and there was some, you know, um, my interpretation was different from the from the building inspectors. OK, so why are we here? Um, we're here seeking relief uh, for front setback requirement of uh, 25 feet uh, to re be reduced to 11 feet uh, for the covered porch and 16 foot for the proper building. Um, I know that uh, variances come uh, are, are a little harder to get. Um, so our hardship is because of the location of our property on Lansdowne um, Road, we do not qualify for the sun front setback reduction um, uh, in per section 5.3.10 of the Arlington bylaws, where the majority of residences on Long uh, Lansdowne Road, as well as the adjacent neighborhoods, um, would qualify for that reduction. Uh, because uh, other than the house that's directly behind us, 57, everybody else on Lansdowne Street would qualify for 5.3.10. And several of the houses are, um, I'd say probably the majority of the houses are, um, uh, non-conforming with regards to the setback um, and not just Lansdowne Street, but the adjacent neighborhoods um, next to it as well. Um, the proposed project is in keeping with the size and style of the houses in the surrounding area. Uh, and furthermore, we're bringing the property into more conformity than uh, than the existing. Um, so therefore, uh, we feel that it doesn't have any negative um, uh, or detrimental to the uh, to the existing neighborhood, and I think it's going to be a, um, a bonus for the neighborhood. Um, the centers have met with most of their neighbors in the neighborhood and um, reviewed the plans with them. And um, I think overall th there was um, uh, support from the neighborhood. We didn't get any uh, anybody speaking out against it, or, or they didn't. I should say they didn't get anybody speaking out against it. And we did get. Uh, two letters of support. If I could share my screen one more time. Yep, you should still have permission. Yep, thank you. And uh, do you see the letters of support here? Yes. Okay, so the uh, first one is from um, 57 uh, Lansdowne Road right here. Um, I really don't want to butcher their name. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the... Uh... They're the bars. Bars. Okay, sorry. Thank you. And I, it's actually the next name that I'm I'm more concerned about. <laughs> Luongo. Yep, that's true. Oh, Luongo. there you go. Okay, so this is uh, 43 uh, Luongo. This is on the corner of Millet, and I, I believe uh, Rebecca. Correct me if I'm wrong. They they own the um, the vacant lot. Um, that's yeah. Correct. So so it's on the corner of Millet. Um, they own the two properties mm -hmm. um, that were shown on the um, on the um, GIS map. And uh, I think I think that's the extent of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you have. Okay, thank you. Um, so just for clarification, so the lot that the house, the existing house is on, and the adjacent lot are they considered a single property, or are they still held as separate lots? I believe that they're. Um, Together, uh, the uh, the the surveyor um, and and um, and civil engineer have been showing them on the same lot. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Rebecca, do you, do you or, or Tim, do you know this for? Um... We have one deed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just gonna quickly. So I'm gonna switch on. Where did I just do this? Um, so this is the, that section five three ten um, that we've been discussing. Average setback minimum. Mm -hmm. So the required lot frontage of developed residential lots along a block amounts to more than 50% of the block frontage. And where said development has an average setback less than that required by this bylaw, then any vacant lot setback for a residential use may be reduced to said average of the existing development. So essentially, as long as at least 50% of the block has to be developed in order for this to count and then if that's the case then a vacant lot can be you then a vacant lot can use the setback um set by the other set by the the existing dwellings um so then going back to the gis view the part of the reason i was asking questions so lansdowne appears to be a paper street that goes all the way out um off the end on to Woodside. Um, and if this is, if the 53 and its adjacent land parcel are considered a single piece of land and 57 and what I'm assuming is its adjacent piece of land and 146 Woodside, which would be the corner house on the paper street with Lansdowne. That would constitute more than 50% of the block. The, the way that it was explained to me is that it, it needs, so I think 146 is on Woodside and 43 mm -hmm. actually might actually be on Rockland. Um, um, so, so I think that's why um, Mr. Champa didn't believe that this met the 50%. Okay. So this, the, this parcel here, see. So That's a double lot for 57. Okay. Because it seems to me that at this point, you've got these. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> the four lots on Lansdowne Street are if it's two parcels they're two the the bylaw is looking for re developed residential lots and i'm uncertain why you know the 53 and it's adjoining lot and 57 and it's adjoining lot could is there a reason that that should or should not be considered it sounds like inspectional services does does not consider that the adjacent the, the 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 adjacent lot on the same deed for 53 doesn't count right towards the the 50 percent of the block and and the other part is that we we can't consider the existing house or or the building in, um inspector as i don't know how many times this has come up this seems like a pretty unique case, but um, his interpretation was that um, we, we can't use the existing house to um, to, to do it. So I, I think at that point, we only have one one property uh, that mm -hmm. has a has an existing front setback. It is not conforming, but with only one, we don't trigger that 50 percent. OK. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just to <clears throat> elaborate on that just a second. This property ultimately will be able to would be able to, to take advantage of it if it was vacant, right? And because they're rebuilding a new house, it would be treated as a vacant house for purposes for purposes of the application of uh, the averaging bylaw. And there's a certain logic to not being able to treat it as vacant for that purpose, but developed for purposes of figuring out the average. Right. Um, could I ask the applicant to put back up the proposed site plan? Sure. Share screen. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we're well outside. So I have another, let's see. We don't have a problem with frontage. We don't have a problem with lot area. So this section doesn't apply. The odd thing is if you shifted the home towards the north so that that the northernmost corner of the house was the corner of the existing house, it would just be a large addition. Yeah, so actually I asked them about that. It, it's really not a road that we want to go down. Um, yeah. Be, because um, but I, I appreciate the, uh, I, I, I love the fact that you're trying to, think outside the box and this is great um i asked them that question i asked mm -hmm. the, uh, both the building inspector and and the building commissioner that question if we were able to keep a um a section of the house uh yeah. could could this be grandfathered in and um we we don't want to do that number one because the existing foundation isn't isn't in, in great great condition and it mm -hmm. makes uh it makes the other things we're trying to get the um the basement or the uh, driveway we're lifting this house up a little bit. Uh, it makes that a lot more difficult. Um, so we're really not interested in going that route. But okay. even if we, even if we were, uh, the building inspector said that you need to keep, uh, uh, I think, fifty percent of the existing foundation for this to even qualify. Which which really, which really, we, we want to do a good project. We don't want to kind of you know sure. Frankenstein it. So yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's a. We also have a section in the bylaw. There's an exemption for energy efficient homes that allows the replacement of a foundation, mm. but it it all it does is allow you to get around the requirement for minimum frontage and minimum lot area. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't address this. It doesn't address the need we have here. Well, and and you know, again, we're improving. I I we I think yeah. we're significantly improving. I mean, you know, going from three point eight from the side setback where. The closest building to us is is this neighbor fifty seven right here, um, you know we're we're three foot three point eight three point eight feet away from this side setback and we're bringing that in into conformity. Uh, mm -hmm. We're also you can see the existing house um, here. Let me uh, zoom in a little bit. You can see I don't know if you guys can see the existing mm -hmm. house dash there. We're actually moving this back. All right, and one other thing I I. Wasn't going to bring this up because I don't want to confuse the, the matter, but I'll I'll um I'll I'll float it out there and see what you guys think. The existing um screen uh, covered porch, we're we're actually allowed to put a portion of that in the um in the setback. Um, we've oversized it a little bit. Uh, I, again, I, I think I've shrunk it down as much as we're comfortable shrinking it down and keeping it in in proportion with the with the elements of the building. Um, and making it usable, you know, somewhat usable too. It's, you know, no, nobody's having a party out there, but you know, you can, you can put a decoration or maybe even a chair out there and watch the kids come home. Um, so that, that's kind of what we were aiming for there, but this is a, a, a covered porch. The original proposal that we were going to submit to the town actually had a, a 12 foot um, setback and we were only putting 12 square feet of this porch within that setback using the, the regulation of, I think they allow up to, 25 or 30. Um, however, I just thought this for this particular, since we were coming before you for a variance regardless, I, we just thought that this was cleaner. The house though, the actual house, the, the main body of the house, this is the part that goes up two and a half stories, is actually 16 foot six, where right now uh, the existing house is nine foot two. So that's a significant improvement. Um, we, we're just on a thin, we're just on a thin lot, unfortunately. 
um, six, um, you know, 64 feet. If we were to follow the, the bylaws without the 20% reduction, I just did the math before uh, the meeting, I, we, we would only be able to do an 18 foot house. So clearly the regulations were, were intending a larger lot here. Um, so this is why, you know, I, this is why we're before you asking for some relief. Mm -hmm. And topographically, the the site is falling towards the south. Correct. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a hill. Lansdowne's a hill, so um, high high point right here, and it it slopes down. It also, yeah, yeah. And the. Okay, I was gonna say there's a little quirk in the way the driveway is drawn, but that's just to avoid the telephone pole. Telephone right? pole, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd love to hear some comments from the from the board. Their questions and comments. Well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> It seems to me that the question about uh, section 5.3.10, if that's what it is, um, is really separate from the from the question about the variance. And one of the reasons I was very interested in the previous discussion about how that would apply and think that maybe we ought to be, I don't know, I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I've completely lost hope on that one, but when you get past that, the essential problem is that the fact that there are not enough other developed properties on mm -hmm. this side of the street doesn't meet the requirement uh, that the uh, that the circumstances relate to the soil conditions, topography, or shape of this property. Um, Obviously, it does create a sort of sense of unfairness about because across the street, uh, it's that way. And and that actually arises from the decision of the building inspector to regard each side of the street as separately. The statute itself says along the block. It doesn't say anything about whether or not you, you count each side separately. Um, if you didn't, then this part would have a pattern that was established on both sides. Uh, if you do have them separately, then you have to assume that what the statute was initially aimed at is maintaining a certain consistency on each side of the street separately, and that it's consistent on one side doesn't influence what happens on the other. But if that's all true, then the sense of unfairness disappears, because, of course, you would want to consider both sides of the street separately. Um, it is rather odd. Uh, it's, you know, as you drive around here, as everyone knows, the there's some, in fact, I think even one of the houses on this block uh, seems to have a 25 foot setback, but it isn't the normal thing. And uh, uh, so it's really, if the underlying point is to maintain consistency with the neighborhood, somehow having the 25 feet observed on this side of Lansdowne and only on this side of Lansdowne in the whole area is a little bit awkward. Um, but I don't know that the state law actually allow, how, allows us to go very far in that direction. Uh, when you go back at it and say, well, all right, suppose you had to live with that. Uh, suppose you had to live with the setback. What is there a, what is the basis under the state law for, uh, for doing that? And it seems to me that everything has to ultimately hangs on uh, what, on the fact that this is a thin lot. Uh, and, you know, you've got 25 feet back in the front, you have your 12.75 feet in the back, that leaves you with about 26 feet, more or less, uh, to build. You've got a fairly long lot, it's not a small lot, partic particularly, but uh, I'm sure it, it really messes up with all the design choices that have already been made. I suspect that there's enough flexibility. You could make a really nice house this way, but you'd be sort of back to the drawing board. Um, if that problem though, if you could create, say that the, that, that thinness, it doesn't leave you with enough flexibility to do what you want to do without undue hardship. 
you might have a sensible, uh, you might have a case that would fit within the the boundaries of the bylaw. But the key thing about it would be it'll all have to be predicated on the uh, dimensions of the lot, the shape, and the fact that it's long and thin. Excuse me, Chair. Can I can I add something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've uh, I've I've served on my uh, zoning board uh, in Denver for for a few years, and um, that is uh, uh, one of one of the criteria for for a variance. Another one is if if the uh, the lot is unique uh, to the area, and that that's my argument here is that because of our location on Lansdowne Street, um, we're at a disadvantage of of the other. Um, um, properties on Lansdowne Street uh, because of how the the bylaw is interpreted. Um, so that that's that makes it a unique uh, issue to this, and therefore um, you would be allowed to grant a variance uh, with that. That is a hardship. I, I don't have the direct language in front of me, but I can provide it for you. Well, the language I don't have it either, but it might. We have consistently interpreted the. Uh, the language has something to do with conditions relating to soil topography or shape that are not shared by other uh, properties in the neighborhood. So it's not been an either or. You couldn't get by without being able to show the soil conditions, topography or shape because uh, uh, because somehow it's unique. Uh, you would the uniqueness has to relate to those. Um, it would be a big, big reversal in our practice to to change that out and to look only at whether it's unique in some other way than that than the way that's specified in the statute. Oh, I just had it, so I can read. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... The Park Grant Authority specifically finds only the circumstances related to the soil condition, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located. Right, and that's the portion that we're we're kind of arguing that the prop where the property is situated is is not uh, a general condition to the um, the typical zoning district anywhere else on the street. With the exception of fifty-seven, has that law has that exception at their disposal? I, I've received variances from from other difficult, not to say that you're a difficult board, but from difficult boards um, based on the premise that that because the land has a unique characteristic to it that puts us at a disadvantage than other lands that that meets that. Um, you know, structures, but not generally affecting the zoning district in which it's located in. But under circumstances where they don't relate to soil conditions, shape, or topography, some other thing than that. Well, it's the, yeah, it's the location of. Um, yeah, but location isn't listed there. We have to find that owing to circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting this land uh, or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located, uh, that, that that's your predicate there. And it doesn't say that you can see that it's unique in some way other than the soil condition, shape, or topography, uh, and that that independently provides a, a sense of uniqueness. All of this, the last part is all connected to the first part. Okay, so I'm looking under uh, I'm looking under the uh, requirement for Massachusetts zoning variance unique conditions, and um, it says requirement one for variance unique conditions. The first requirement for a variance is showing that the property has unique conditions, specifically that it must show that there are circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, topography, or such land structures and especially affecting land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I don't, I, I'm not sure that they're, they're saying that it, only those things apply. I, they, yeah, they don't, I'm not sure. You, 
it's a leap to say that those are the only things that could affect a um a property. So if the board if the board was just just for sake of argument, if the board was to accept the premise that the board does have the authority to grant a variance. Um then we would still need to determine that the determination for the setback involves both existing properties before the demolition of one of the properties. And it would not just a not just be that we would assume it's a vacant property and because one house has a 20 foot setback, this house has a 20 foot setback. Is that correct? Are, are you saying you want to make sure that the lots are combined? Well, no, so that if the so if the if we accepted the premise that you could have a variance um based on topography or soil condition or whatever what would you're also saying then that section 5310 should be applied using the existing structure that you're then removing rather than just relying on the existing structure which would be 57 yeah, so that that's how we move forward with the design. Um, and yeah. at the time, we we were just trying to use the you know what what, what we had at our disposal. Um, okay. So now that it's been designed and 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 built, that's what we're hoping that the board will help us with. Um, we think it's reasonable. Um, if if you did average the two houses that are currently on the street, um, you would end up with um, a, a setback that's actually a little bit closer than what we're proposing. Yeah. Um, for the main house. So we are improving it. We're getting, you know, we're making improvements to the to the right. property. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. I'm not sure. I mean, you and your family would have more uh, better grasp of the rigorous definitions of mathematical terms, but it seems to me that that if an average of one thing is the is the value for that one thing that mm -hmm. you just take it and divide by the number you, you know you take the value and divide by n and and I'm not sure why n can't be one as a definitional matter um, that it I would find it well it seems yeah. arbitrary if, if the only, I mean, the, the reason for doing this, the reason for the statute is so that you don't sort of piggyback on these things and you, and start with it, with a mostly undeveloped area and you build out, you disregard the setback. And then that sets a new average, which gets lower and lower until you've got the whole street that is, that could have been built out in conformity with the zoning bylaw now isn't because of the first house that went in there. So you can see why it is they might do that, but I don't know if mathematically uh, I wouldn't get hung up on the average part and not having any reference. It's it's much more difficult to come up with the majority of the frontage part. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we have the facts before us to be able to say that it isn't a majority of the of the frontage. When we went through this before, under your guidance, Mr. Chairman, there were a lot of suppositions, and and we we might find out that that there's a stronger case on the facts than we than we know. And then how, how would you recommend to get to that point? Well, the, the, I've, I haven't really thought this through as well as, as the rest of you have, but it seems to me that what we're trying to do is figure out what is the frontage that counts, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the... the when somebody has two lots together, does that does the entire frontage of those two lots count as the frontage that's developed, or does the fact that one of the lot contains somebody's backyard or side yard mean that that's not developed? But we don't know for sure from the GIS maps whether they're two really two lots or one. They're uh, one. And if they are, I don't know why you don't get to why you don't get to count the entire frontage if it's one lot. That's what we that's are counting the, the, the unit. Um, and that may be true of the other lots as well that are along that street. We don't really know. I don't know. I mean, you, you guys yeah. may know. So, 
So it is, it is one lot. And I, by frontage, do you mean the actual frontage on Lansdowne Street or do you mean the front setback? No, I, by frontage, I mean the frontage on Landon Street. When you read the uh, 5.3.10, uh, what it says is where the required lot frontage of developed residential lots along a block amounts to more than 50% of the block frontage. So what you're supposed to be doing is looking at the frontage on the street and separating out the developed residential lots from the not developed residential lots, seeing whether that comes up to 50% or more. Where you have... So if you had two lots, conceivably, you'd have to separate that out if the lots were combined so that it was really one lot, technically as one lot, then all of the frontage would would be able to count. And that should be true of every lot along the side of the street. So and so I mean, the ones that are to your right aren't developed at all. Uh, so those are going to come into the undeveloped category. I'm not equally certain about the 57 on the other side and whether if it was just your lot in 57, whether that's enough to make up a majority of what you need. Okay, but that's not how the, the building inspector interprets these. So, I mean, another way to look at it is if we're only allowed to do one house, um, the existing the existing house on 57 has a front setback of um 14 um sorry it's getting late um 14.5 feet and we're proposing the house the majority you know the house at 16.5 so we're actually pulling it back from the from the front of theirs I certainly would like to be able to fit this under 5.3.10 rather than pushing our our established definition of uh, variance. Now, it's true that that even under our established definition, if you just look at the narrowness of the lot, that might give you something to, to work with. Shape of the lot is one of the things that we do get to look at. Um, but I don't know whether you get all the way home if you start from that that beginning point. Excuse me, Bill. D yep. Dave Crispin here. Um, yep. One thing you haven't mentioned tonight is topography. This lot has about 11 foot difference in grade from the top of the hill down. So it's very steep. It's over 10%. That certainly affects how you use the property. So just looking at South Middlesex, so the property it, it is a single deed but it's listed as having two parcels so i don't know if that affects how the building inspector was reading it or not if that's the case then we have a like a three thousand foot lot three thousand and change foot lot the size of it is becomes our hardship I, mean, I I think the path is clear. I you know yeah. again I I think the uh, if you're looking for a hardship the uniqueness of the lot I, I think it's we've we've given you a path to to um to consider um, with the hardship mm -hmm. the the building department I believe me I, I wish this fit under five point three point ten yeah. myself because we wouldn't in theory be in front of you um, but they just don't look at it that way so. It seems like a variance is the cleanest path. Does the house meet the intent of the bylaw? Are, are we mm -hmm. are we going outside of the norms of the of the neighborhood? That's you know, which we don't think we are. Right. M Mr. Chair, Mr. Holly, is in the lot on its own is less than 5,000 square feet and a merger theory would have been applied to the neighboring and combined to be merged into one lot to meet the frontage requirement. And that leads us to that being a one single lot with 100 feet you know, frontage, mm -hmm. more than likely, right? So 
so you know the the whole both the the hunt based on that definition of five point three point or based on what's written in five point three point ten the the lot frontage would be the whole lot of hundred feet and there's only two lots um, for calculations for those and I, I don't know if deletion of you know not counting the existing you know makes any more sense in that case. Um, right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. The zoning bylaw defines a lot as an area or parcel of land or any part thereof, not including water area, in common ownership, designed ah. or designated on a plan filed with the inspector of buildings by its owner or owners as sep a separate lot and having boundaries identical with those recorded in the Middlesex County Registry of Deeds. So presumably that's the definition that we have to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that but certainly the deed for fifty three includes both of those parcels, right? And the the first deed I came across for fifty seven is just for the single lot; it doesn't include the other, so I can't tell if they're in common ownership or not. I'm not doing deed research, but um, what does appear so the street itself is like two hundred scaling here uh it's like 283 284 feet long um and the properties you know so the between the two lots of 53 and the lot of 57 Is like 156 feet, so it's more than 50 percent. So I just don't know is if the, if the building department looking at this as you can't take that, you have to take the average, assuming that 53 has already been demolished, or in which case, then now you do only have one small developed lot, or are they saying? that they don't think that 53 and 57 together currently meet the requirement for 50% of the of the block. Yep. That's a question, all right. Yeah. But but it is uh, Mr. Chair, it is a yeah. developed residential lot. Right. Um, that's where. Yeah. So certainly 50. Let me go back and share the, um, the GIS view here. So definitely 53, 53 with its adjoining lot appear on a single deed. Right. So they're held in common ownership. And certainly 57 and the parcel next to it are both owned by the same entity. Um, so they're in common ownership, which is the requirement. So it would appear that, you know, from this lot line, from you know, this parcel all the way up to this parcel here is currently developed. and would quant qualify as developed land. And you would have this one with this lot, you know, arguably, uh, is in common ownership, is, is you know, is in common ownership with this, so this is a developed lot too. That's actually on Rockland now. I mean, the house is on Rockland, the address. Yeah. 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 But because this is a, this is, as by the definition definition that Mr. Hanlon read, this would be considered, you know, a single piece, the two together, because of the common ownership. So the okay, so the, can can I use forty three and fifty seven then? I mean, I, ultimately the building inspector has to, um, 
I guess sign off on that. But mm -hmm. if I if I'm able to use forty three to Rockland and fifty seven to to Lansdowne, then I am um we'll, we'll be able to be closer. I mean, we're not going to change it. We're we're hoping to stay right where we're yeah. at. Well, I think the the question that I would have is is the consideration that because we are looking to redevelop a parcel that parcel has to be considered vacant in order to make the calculation or can we make the calculation and then use that calculation in the redevelopment of a lot? Now, unfortunately, that's a question that sort of talk to the inspector about. Yeah, well, you're looking at the language, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, in order to deal with the frontage issue, it's where the re required lot frontage of developed residential lots along the block amounts to more than 50%. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, <clears throat> so then you can say, well, 53 and yeah. the, the two lots or the combined lot uh, should count for that because that's a developed residential lot. But then the last sentence is any vacant lot setback for a residential use may be reduced to set coverage of the existing development. And so now you, in order to take advantage of the last part, which is where you want to go, you have to treat that lot that has uh, the address 53 on it as a mm -hmm. vacant lot. And now, of course, in reality, that's exactly what's going to happen. Right now it's developed and pretty soon it'll be vacant. But the... Yeah. Uh, uh, the theory that enables anybody to take advantage of this with all through the town is that when you do it, when you tear the structure down, you become a vacant lot. Uh, and the question is whether the fact that you, when you do the frontage calculation, you're not a vacant lot yet enables you to basically have it both ways. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, that I'm not sure that the building inspector has a preconceived answer about that. Right. <laughs> Well, it does sound that we're sort of a little bit at an impasse until we have an opportunity to discuss this with the with the building inspector to better understand how they're interpreting this. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, could I could I just ask? Okay. Uh... Instead of trying to jam this through five point three point ten, yeah, um, can can I just ask the 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 board's um, opinion on granting the variance? Is this is this project seen as a detriment or? I mean, it's really it. So as you know, there's the four criteria for variance. Um, You know, so circ you know, circumstances related to soil condition, shape, topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zone district in which it is located. Um, so I think we agree that there's no issue with shape and there's no issue with soil conditions. So it comes down to a question of topography. And, you know, that whole street is sloped um it's not like this is one lot that's quirky or one or you know of a small set of streets that that is has a topological difference it, it's you know topologically this whole side of arlington is this way um so our premise for uh, a hardship um that doesn't by your interpretation meet the definition of a hardship that the fact that that we're at a disadvantage with this particular lot based on the interpretations of the bylaw uh, from the from the town yeah i mean i was looking to see if you know maybe the you know because the lot's somewhat shallow like you know is that i mean can that yeah can I that mean, go along with the with the shape of it 
Yeah. So, I mean, I'm looking at that, but then like all the houses that are oh, on Rockland have that same depth um, as do the first two houses on the other side of Millet. So it's not. Not all of, I mean, the, the yeah. 30, 43 and 34 are quite close. Yeah. And, and, and they're actually quite, quite set back too. Right. So they're, they're, they're not getting on, on the front, but they are, they're, they're really close to the back. Right. And then you look on Lansdowne street, there's, there's similar, uh, you know, particularly down 30, 26, 20, th those are all, you know, kind of the similar and, and where, and, you know, you look at 54, 46 and 42, those are the opposite. Those are very deep lots. And those are the ones that are closest to the street. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I, I've gotten variances in the past, again, uh, based yeah. off of uh, uniqueness of the uh, of the lot. I mean, I can pull up case law on that. So mm -hmm. I believe there is a pathway there. It's up to this board to determine, yeah. you know, what is and what isn't a hardship. Um, but I, I would just try to, I'm just trying to ascertain that the board's you know, um, view on this project. Do yeah. they see this as a good project or, or I mean, a detriment? Yeah, I mean, certainly... I think it's a very well thought through process, uh, through project. Um, you know, I, I like the building itself. I like the way it's designed. I think it reacts well to the, to the neighborhood and to the site conditions. Um, it's frustrating that the way the bylaw is written, that you are taking a non-conforming building and you're making it more conforming but because it is a new it because it's a new building and not an addition it there are certain advantages that it's not allowed to take advantage of um right and, and that but that's why we have the variance process to allow this board to to, to look at specific circumstances and but and this would apply to any house there's right. nothing there's nothing i i i think the I mean, the struggle I'm having is I, I'm i not seeing something that's unique to this parcel or, you know, or to, you know, several parcels that doesn't necessarily apply to other, you know, to other houses in the, to the zoning district. I mean, there's, because there's just, there are no other, other no other house with the exception of 57 is disqualified from 5.3.10. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. yeah, Mr. Hamlin, I, I I don't think that that I wouldn't I would I'm sympathetic with the project too. I think it's a good project, and I and for all of the reasons that the chair just said, I don't believe that it is an invidious discrimination that they can't take advantage of three three five point three point ten. I think that the statute was written precisely in order to prevent them from getting that from being able to take advantage of that. And it, this wasn't an accident. It's not like something that was just done inadvertently. When they did that, they were deliberately intending to make sure that what this was about was filling in some a few gaps on the side of the street, assuming that that interpretation is correct and you're not looking at both sides of the street. And because they wanted to be able to allow the last vacant lots basically to be made consistent with what's already done and not allowing the first vacant lots to establish a pattern that would be finished off by the rest and all of it in contradiction to the bylaw. So this is this is a distinction that is there because the the uh, because town meeting when it passed this bylaw intended it to be there. And that makes it not an invidious or an unfair discrimination. It's a discrimination that was established by law because there was a policy behind it. And this is, to be sure, a really crazy bylaw. And we've talked about various amendments that could be made to it. But from where it is right now, the I'm at least not particularly moved by the argument that any that the other side of the street can take advantage of it and this side of the street can't. And the other house that's right next to it is in the same position as this. It's not, it's not unique. And, you know, two, just, two of the it just only rarely house. happens. It just rarely mm -hmm. happens here. It's only a one you were doing block by block. And this is a block that has at most what five, five lots to it.
Mr. Chair, I would. Yes, Mr. Holly. Yeah, I would agree with 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 what what Mr. Hanlon is saying is because um, it, it is applied to me the way I read it is you know for a lot that has for a block that has all you know many houses already built you know existing, and one lot they're trying to you know the, that's how I read the the same thing and it doesn't make it unique. It's it's to address a unique condition, but not. Uh, having application of this doesn't mean makes you the project unique, you know, um, yep. the exception to that. So the bylaw is there for an ex, you know, to address a unique condition and not addressing it doesn't make the other way unique, you know. Right, right. Um, right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would say that it's unfortunate because the policy that I think the bylaw is aiming at produces a will produce eventually a weird result. I mean, I, 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 as a town meeting member, I'd vote against, I'd vote in favor of amending this appropriately in a heartbeat because you don't particularly want everybody else to be having, you know, an, as a relatively small, there's a pattern here of having relatively not deep front yards. And if this all developed with 25 feet front yard depths, it mm -hmm. would look out of place with everything else. I mean, it, it in that sense, from a from a policy point of view, I think that the the bylaw is is not well designed here. But it was designed for an earlier area era. Well, it's just sort of a, a a thought experiment here. So, if they were to construct this house on the lower half of the lot, the undeveloped half of the lot, and then dem demolish the existing house afterwards. It seems like they would be able to take advantage of that section. I don't think we can develop on that lot because it doesn't meet, um, well, one, it's combined, but it doesn't meet the- uh, 5,000 square feet. Yeah. It's not, it's not large enough to put another right. house on it. Okay. If you had a good foundation, you could. You could take advantage of the law that, that allows you out of the restrictions on the, on the lot size uh, if you have a, a foundation that meets environmental, you know, the environmental rate, which, which pretty soon by code you need to do anyway because... Mm -hmm. I the, mean, could they take advantage of that on the current site? If are they allowed to consider that? Or well, no, the, then yeah, they are. The, 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 the problem, set. yeah, the, the problem is if you're dealing with lot size, if that's the issue, you get lot size and frontage that gets you out of, yeah, not the setback, not the setback. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I can add one thing, Dave Crispin, yes, I'm a civil engineer on this. The uniqueness of this lot, as I look around, this is the only lot that has a garage under in the neighborhood, which is something that they're trying to fix with this design. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled my car into their driveway. When you pull your car into their driveway down into the garage, you can't see where you're going because it's so steep looking over the hood. I doubt a you know, Chevy van would fit in this garage. Yeah. So from a uniqueness of a lot perspective, this is the only house in the area that topographically has a garage under that limits how the existing facility can be used. Just one more, Ryan. Um, yeah, I think at this point, I'm not sure we really are near a resolution, um, but I do need to allow the public access to the hearing, which I have not done, <laughs> done yet. Um, so I will go ahead and open the, the hearing for public comment. Um,
So again, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of helping us inform our decision. Uh, there is nobody calling in, so you may use the reaction, the raise hand button on the reactions tab um, if you would like to raise a point. And we have Mr. Moore. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Anyone else who wishes to address this this item? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Um, so I I think this is something that the that deserves a little more thought from the board um, and a little bit of uh, some discussion with the building inspector on exactly how he's interpreting things um in this case and i think it might do us to research research and also the applicants to, to research the case law a little bit um to see where where it sort of comes down on this question um and if the applicants are amenable i would recommend continuing um we could continue to february 13 which is our our next date if that date works for you or the next one after that would be the 27th we can make the third. I can make the thirteenth work. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hamlin. I wonder. I I think that it would be nice if during this period of time, uh, that uh, Mr. Nolan provided whatever guidance he has on the law regarding his broad view of what the first two mean, and we should take that and whatever and and our own history which is quite different and uh, discuss it with Mr. Cunningham and and you know see if we can come to uh, a resolution of just exactly what those first two two uh, mm -hmm. conditions mean i i think that we don't necessarily need to rely on unfairness as the hardship if we're able to first find that whatever the problem is there is due to it is either Due to soil topography or shape, or um, or uh, uh, or it doesn't have to be. Yeah, uh, we can well, we we can get past the, the hardship. Isn't going to be a real. It's not nearly as hard as what it is that constitutes a unique condition. No, absolutely, and just just for the applicant's benefit, Mr. Cunningham is the town council. Okay. Um, I, I uh, I'm just a little unclear on what Mr. Harlan was asking for, though. Uh, so basically, um, I think you had mentioned that you had some case law that, yeah, you felt um, reinforced your position, and so we would just, if you could, identify what that is for us and let us know so we can. So to be really clear on what well. the Mr. Chairman, to be really clear, at least I think that the discussion we've had so far has to do with whether or not some kind of uniqueness that does not relate back to soil shape or soil condition shape or topography can count as being the distinguishing factor that that can be the predicate for the rest of the of the variance process we have always said that that it has to be both one of those three characters and it has to be unique so that something that has a general soil problem it's a marsh uh, would not count because it's it's not because other properties have the same same thing, and Mr. Dolan is taking the view that if even if it's unique for some other reason than the reasons as named in the statute, that's enough uniqueness to count, and that's that's the proposition that has to be sustained in order to take the broad view of the first uh, variance criterion that Mr. Nolan is advancing to us. If I could say something just briefly oh, as a homeowner, <laughs> um, from the topography standpoint, and, and Dave, please chime in or correct me if I'm wrong, uh, our particular lot, the side of the lot that the house is on is more flat than the vacant lot uh, that we also own. The steepness gets worse as you go down the hill um and so and and 57 which is uphill from us is actually a relatively flat lot for both of their parcels um and so the 
house being on the position that it is on the lot is uh, if we were to move it sort of to the center, if we were maintained by the 25 foot setback, we would enter a period of steepness that is not, would not be something that, for example, 57 would encounter if they were to do the same. Mr. Chairman, if I could just also say that that illustrates why shape and topography go together. Yep. Because the reason why you'd have to go down the hill is because the shape is sufficiently narrow that you can't achieve your objectives without making it longer. And making it longer means that the topography disadvantage fits in. So, I mean, that kind of an analysis is at least in the in my view in the right ballpark uh, and could produce the conclusion that there would be an unreasonable hardship here. We've generally not been as tough on unreasonable hardship as we have been on soil shape and topography. I mean, the other piece of that is that in the neighborhood on our street, the double there are double lots around. And, and as you've seen by looking at the GIS images throughout this entire conversation, they're each really positioned on one portion, one parcel, and there's an oh, the other space has remained open. And so if we were to generate a house that covered our whole lot, both parcels, it would be narrow and it would take out over what we consider our backyard uh, and would negatively impact the neighbors on the lower side of the hill and also behind us on that side of the hill that don't currently have a house right, right behind them. Um, and so we're, you know, the goal of the project was really to maintain the the existing conditions as best as we can. And we thought even moving it back a bit from where the house currently sits on the lot would be a benefit. Is it unprecedented to change our hardship? Can can can, our, can that now be our hardship? If sure. that's if that's acceptable. I mean, we're looking at any hardship. At the hardship that really exists, you're, you're not stuck with what position people uh, before us have completely reversed positions on occasion. Can we do that now? What are you looking to do again? So it sounds like um, by if we're forced to keep the um, the 25 foot setback front setback. Mm -hmm. It's going to result in and in, in achieve a similar uh, similar size house to what they're looking to do, and that we feel is in keeping uh, with the neighborhood. It's going to force us to have a long, thin house. The length of the house is going to take us from a, a flat area of our lot to a sloped area of our lot and create a hardship financially for us. Oh, um, I mean, again, essentially, it's the same project. We're trying to do a good project. It fits the neighborhood. We're just looking for a, a vehicle. We're, we're we're trying to give you guys oh, absolutely license to to be able to grant this. Yeah, um, yeah. We've got neighborhood yeah. support. It's it's a it's a good project. We're trying oh, to do it's a absolutely good a good project. I mean, the the other thing we haven't talked about yet is usable open space. Um, we meet that because. Usable open space can't be more than 8%. Oh. <laughs> and the whole lower part of the slope is site is sloped, um, which I doubt there's enough land on your site that meets the 8% category um, at all. Um, and certainly the site as it is, occupied now the site does not have usable open space once you raise the house i don't know if it if there's land that qualifies dave is it possible is it possible with the excavation to uh to um change that from what do we need seven percent yeah, eight seventy five percent has to be less than eight percent slope. I think is I think is what it says. With with the um, excavation for the um um the the new house, do you think we'll have enough fill to to gradually? I mean, because we're pretty close. It's it's about eight percent, isn't it? The site's about ten percent right now. Okay, so and we so would could, need could we could could we create a patio that's eight percent? Yeah, 
you probably could. You're gonna have to probably bring dirt into the site to do it. Yeah. So, so that the usable, I, I don't think that's before you. So, I, I think nope. we could, I, we could probably deal with that. Okay. They do use it. They have they have a garden on that eight percent right now. Yeah, but that's so not it's usable. I play soccer on it. Our son plays. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, this is a highly artificial definition, and there's a lot of stuff that's actually usable that isn't usable for this purpose. And there's you. It, it just it, it, it's it's a lot of people come it's a difficult it presents a difficult situation mm -hmm. but it will be i mean if if in fact the, i mean if if we gave you a variant or if we didn't and it would only be for the what you've asked us to do if usable open space was not part of it then you and mr champa says oh by the way um then you're no further along than you are right now mm -hmm. we're putting in a drainage system so i uh dave mm -hmm. uh you know better than i uh any chance what, what's what's it entail to get the um the site below seven percent or below eight percent the only way I, without adjusting the floor grades of the house the only way i can think is filling the lower half and creating a significant embankment around the, the lower perimeter. Yeah, see, I mean, this is really not, the, the bylaws shouldn't shouldn't be forcing people to do weird stuff to their properties. I mean, that's- Right, sure, it's true. It's, a, yeah, I don't know. It's a usable site, I mean, they use it. Uh, it's, a, it's a vacant site. In fact, that was the, the main reason why they wanted to keep the house in the same location. Um, because they enjoy the yard. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you guys have a job to do, and I know that you're just trying to um, follow the bylaws here, but um, we're trying to give you uh, an avenue to accept this project. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not, and the center has done a pretty good job of that, actually. I think that there is at least a path that's worth thinking about. Um, I think that if we were able to find that the, I mean, Ultimately, if you if this is worth the variance for one thing, it's worth a variance for the other, right? You, mm -hmm. it's the the unreasonable hardship will be the same, and to some extent, the reason why it is that that you don't have usable open space has to do with the same topological conditions that we've just been talking about. So it's all it's all bundled together, as as you note, as you've completely seen from a design point of view. Uh, and so I wouldn't necessarily say, well, we 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 have a it meets the requirements for variance of the front yard depth, but not the usable open space. It's if if it should be built, notwithstanding one problem with the zoning bylaw, probably it should be it it can be done with respect to two. So we uh, need to resubmit um, a uh, a variance for for the front setback based on the hardship of topography and also the usable space. I don't know. I mean, we haven't. Mr. 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 Chairman, what do you think? What do we need to do? I mean, it's one thing what we can take into consideration. I think we can take all arguments into consideration. It's another thing if they're asking for another. For a variance that meets a different description and that the question there is whether or not you have adequate notice to the public. So the variance, the, 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 yeah, so the legal notice references section 5310 and 542, and 542 is the dimensional table. So if the variance is in relation to those things, so either the average setback or to the table of dimensional regulations, then it no matter what it is, we can cover it by under this notice. So if they were, you know, if if they decided, well, we're just going to shift the house towards the back of the lot and we will meet the front yard setback, but we won't meet the rear yard setback, that would still qualify under here because it's still under 542. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as requiring 
a new request. Um, a usable open space is included in 542 as well, right? So the percentage of usable open space is part of 542. So, you know, it, it meets the terms of the notification. I don't think that there's any formal new filing that needs to be done. If there's if there's anything you want to put in writing and submit, if we if we continue, mm -hmm. then you're obviously quite welcome to do that. Yeah, and we certainly I know in the past we have granted variances on usable open space because of um, excessive slope of the site um, and the inability to provide usable open space that. Um, that the definite that the, that use that providing the usable open space is not there's no is not beneficial to the site or to the to the neighborhood in those in that case um so I, yeah I, th I think at this stage we really just need to continue to the 13th um and does you know the the board will have to talk to council and talk to the the building commissioner to figure out exactly where you know what we're allowed to do in this circumstance and how we can you know what what we can do to come up with a defensible decision um and in the meantime i think we would ask the applicant to consider you know a sort of if there is case law that is supportive of of their in, of their case, we absolutely would you know be very glad to hear of it. Um, but I think you know also considering how if there are any modifications that you know might be considered um, that might somehow help the situation because. And then we Mr. just reached Dean on the 13th. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask one other thing is sure. that we've we've gone, I mean, Ms. Center has spent roughly 40 seconds talking about this subject a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that if that's the way we're going to go, we need a little bit more information about developing that a little bit. And it may very well be that Mr. Crispin would has some things to say that that would help us understand the the consequences of having of forcing them to try to comply with the the bylaw but given the shape and topography of 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 the site but you know i wouldn't say necessarily you have to have 20 pages but having something with a little bit of evidence for us to rely on would make it easier to make that decision later on no certainly yeah, we're happy to do that. Due to the technical nature, we tried to uh, leave it to the professionals. But um, yeah, we'd be happy the to center speak did more. great. <laughs> um, I can yeah. speak to the emotions of it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, we did want to, you know, just briefly in terms of a, a personal statement, right? I mean, we've lived, you know, in the town for, you know, seven years. Our first house, starter home, have a yep. kid here, in the, you know, neighborhood. It's all a bunch of, you know, four or five year old boys. Um, you know, we spent you know, the last two years ago, looking for houses in other towns, you know, the whole reason we're doing this is because we looked at a bunch of other towns and we wanted to be here. I'm um, yeah. going to be in this neighborhood. So we really want this to work. Um, so, you know, we're just, you know, we're dedicated to um, trying to see the project through um, and, you know, hopefully making things work out. So okay. just, just wanted to, yeah, say that. No, well. absolutely. Thank you. One technical question on usable open space, 80%. Yep. Can it be can it be terraced? Can yeah. it be two two flat flatter areas terraced? I think so. So you only need to provide 30% of the gross floor area as usable. Floor area or a lot area? Of no, of the gross floor area of the house. The floor so area. you only need to provide, I think it's 1362 square feet of usable we've already got that. We probably already and have only, that with the patio. With the patio, yeah. And like 75% of it. You only need 75% of that. So whatever that number comes down to. But you need you need to be the 25 feet square part too. Yeah. So what yeah, so it has to be at least 25 by 25. But any but you 
can count patio space as long as it's not as long as 75 percent of it is open to the sky above you can count it right. so patios are good decks are good stairs are you exterior stairs are usually included within that um just not driveways we almost meet that with the patio now right and if it's a new building with a driveway at grade then essentially it is you it's only 20 by 20 i'm pretty sure i have to investigate that okay all right then so then with the permission of the applicant i would um move that we um continue this hearing um on 53 Lansdowne Street until Tuesday February 13th at 7:30 p.m. second okay so this is a vote of the board to continue the hearing for 53 Lansdowne Road until Tuesday, February 13th at 7.30 p.m. Um, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Rigardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 53 Lansdowne Road. Thank you all very much for sticking with us this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that is everything that is on our agenda this evening. Um, let me just confirm. Yeah, that's everything. So as we've said a couple times, our next meeting will be uh, February 13th at 7.30. Um, I believe there are two items on the agenda already. So this will uh, be two additional items, the two continuances from tonight. Um, and then our next meeting is Tuesday, February 27th after the 13th. Um, so that's what we're doing. Mr. Chair, before, yes, sir. You, move, before you move to adjourn, could I make a comment? Mr. Moore? I, I just, I mean, that last case is why you folks are one of the unsung group of heroes in the town. I mean, you have to interpret abstruse laws, you have to apply them to odd or unique situations, and you all do it for long hours and no pay, and I wish there was more appreciation for folks that have that kind of dedication to the town's, you know, values and hopes and dreams. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate your kind words. So with that, I will thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially would like to thank Colleen Ralston and Mike Joppa for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So move, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. And a second? So I do want not here, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Without Hamlin. Roger, we're stuck until the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion to adjourn. Mr. Hamlin. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. The chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Mm -hmm.